Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, and welcome to the National Consultation on Building for Disaster Resilience. Our theme, our theme this morning is be prepared before the high winds come. Honorable Mayor Amor Martley, QC, MP, QC, Prime Minister, Honorable George Payne, Minister of Housing, Lands, and Rural Development, Honorable Dr. William Dugid, Minister of Transport, Works, and Maintenance, Honorable Charles Griffith, Minister in the Ministry of Housing, Lands, and Rural Development, Honorable Peter Phillips, Minister in the Ministry of Transport, Works, and Maintenance, Honorable Dale Marshall, Attorney General, Mr. Neil Rowe, Parliamentary Secretary. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, and I thank you for attending this very important consultation on building for resilience. I am not going to spend a long time welcoming you here because we are more interested in the presentations and the outcomes from this forum as opposed to hearing uh, very lengthy speeches. But what I will I'll share one thing with you in that research has shown that for every dollar we spend on enhancing infrastructure and making it more resilient, it saves us $4 in the rebuilding process. And I would like you to take a very careful note of that because this is exactly what we are trying to, what we are trying to achieve. So I invite you this morning to um, listen to our presentations, be very active during our question and answer discussions so that we can leave here and capture the essence of the critical information that is important to us in this forum. And without further ado, I invite the Honorable Mayor Motley, Prime Minister, to deliver the feature remarks. Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Cummins, ministers of government, ladies and gentlemen, um, particularly those of you in the industry, the construction industry. I am very happy to be here because this event is one that has been long in coming for me. Over the course of the last few weeks, <clears throat> I have had to address too many instances of what the implications are for climate change. And the science cannot be clearer, but the consequences, regrettably, are all now too patent and being felt. Our country, at this juncture, would be doing a disservice to those Barbadians who will come after if we do not make a decisive intervention in changing a number of things. How we build, how we prepare ourselves, how we eat even, all of these things contribute to one, either our vulnerability continuing, or two, our own contribution, regrettably, to the emission of greenhouse gases. There was a time when this topic would have been considered esoteric or out there for a few, a few technocrats or a few policy geeks. But believe you me when I tell you that what we face throughout this earth is common. Last Thursday, I listened quietly as the Prime Minister of Honduras delivered himself of remarks that showed the extent to which the drought in that country is literally crippling them. 
I can go on and on. Some of you can go now on your phone and you can go to a YouTube video with respect to the groundwater crisis that the world is facing and the extent to which we have our own issues here, which have seen salinity creep into some of the wells from which we have been pulling water. In this particular instance this morning, however, we are not trying to be all things to all people because we make a difference by being strategic and by claiming ground and setting new ground for claiming tomorrow. And the ground which we are seeking to claim today is simply how we build, particularly in low-income circumstances for low-income houses. The truth is that people who can afford it will hire all of the professionals to help them. They'll hire an architect first, they'll hire an engineer, they'll hire a quantity surveyor. But the majority of low-income housing, and that is where traditionally the greatest damage comes, and as a result of the property damage, loss of life. But the low-income housing that we have framework, that we have followed, has been one that really has been developed as a response to another storm, another hurricane. And I am not old enough to speak firsthand, although I suspect that there are one or two in this room who might be able to. But I am told that after Hurricane Janet lashed the south of the island in particular, including the destruction of a church that was being used as a shelter and the consequential loss of life, for those who were sheltering in that church. That there were insufficient numbers of carpenters in the island to meet the demand. And therefore, anybody who could hold a hammer and could effectively use the hammer, even if they did not know the rudiments of carpentry, became involved in the mission of rebuilding houses and that the traditional construction, the traditional chattel house construction with the gable roofs, with the fixed louvers in the gable, was abandoned for something that was quicker and easier to build for those who couldn't quite understand the physics of what they were doing. And you and I both know that a number of the carpenters and other tradesmen that we had were master tradesmen, were master carpenters. And we allowed, therefore, that temporary fix of what I call the flat roofs to become the norm. And the absence of the ability of professionals to be afforded by those building low-income housing individually meant that people literally built off of the same design and that fellas would draw it out on the back of a trumpeter box. And for those who are too young to know what a trumpeter box is, you can replace it with a box of bents and the hedges. But that became the norm. And they perfected that design. My greatest fear has always been, and I've said it publicly, one of them has been a hurricane destroying a large percentage of our housing stock. And we have said that you will either pay for a disaster before or you will pay after. But it is clear to most of us that it is far cheaper to pay for it before because we can minimize, one, the scale of the damage and hence the costs, but more importantly, 
the extent to which persons can be injured and regrettably even in some instances lose their lives. Study your head. When you see the disasters globally or even regionally, it is those houses that are poorly built or inadequately built or on the sides of mountains when they're landslides. In the case of the Bahamas, it was a large settlement of Haitians that perhaps has caused, um, and that, that irregular settlement, unplanned settlement, was perhaps one of the worst affected in terms of the density of persons living there. And we have come, therefore, here today to start the process. We don't have the luxury of time. As we mentioned to others who we are trying to appreciate why we need to move to a vulnerability index to determine access to concessional funding rather than the crude measurement of GDP that means nothing in the context of our exposure. But as we mentioned to them, we have, in our, this particular instance, 61 days left in this season. But the bad news is that we are also nine months from the start of the next season. And I said that to perhaps put in context why time is not on our side and to place in context why we need those of you to step up to the plate quickly. The Ministry of Housing will be putting out a request for proposals and I hope that they will have it done before the end of the week for house designs, for low-income housing and lower-middle-income housing to begin to influence what can become the new norm and the new standard for this country, particularly for low-income housing and lower-middle-income housing. It has to be a design that is resilient in every aspect, not just the roofs, but our capacity, as I said in the budget this year, that every house really ought to have its own water tank, portable water tank. And we need to revisit the regulations hitherto that would have required houses over a certain size to have water tanks, non-portable water tanks, which may well unwittingly have contributed to aspects of public health difficulties because of the way in which we haven't integrated it properly in the design and function of the house. Similarly, we have to build houses that are sustainable in every respect with respect to energy and how best can we treat to renewable energy given the country's stated goal of a fossil fuel free country. Thirdly, we have to build for breeze to circulate in a house. I contend that housing policy is critical to cultural policy and to the policies that we develop with respect to building social capital and fighting the worst aspects of social decay. I've never seen a block that's in the middle of hot sun or hot. Every block in this country, study ahead, is in the shade. <laughs> and it's in the shade because people want shade and breeze. And invariably, blocks emerge because first and foremost, people want somewhere to retreat to. But there are too many people either in the house or too many people are coming into the space. And what do people do? Go and find somewhere to chill. 
to relax. And when others of similar mind come together, you then have the core lesson for that. There had to be a reason why a house as small but as dignified looking as the traditional chattel house was as functional as it was. And I am not a contractor. I am not an architect. I am not an engineer. But I am a student of Barbadian history and Barbadian culture. And the wisdom of those who went before with respect to having the circulation in the house through the fixed louvers seems to me to be one of the reasons why those roofs was sustainable and seems to me to be one of those reasons why those houses were habitable and when you add to that the use of the sash windows with the hood and the shutters <laughs> the heaviest rain could be falling outside but you still have wind circulating in the house because of the protection of the shutters. Sorry that the shutters, the sash window down, or even the shutters for that matter, with the fixed louvers for the breeze coming through, and the hood to also stop the angle from coming in. I am asking, therefore, that those of us who have the honor of leading the construction industry in Barbados at this stage, pause and reflect and determine how best we can change our design, particularly for low income and lower middle income housing for the times while respecting the Barbadian vernacular that we have inherited that is not only aesthetically pleasing, but is also functional for the climate within which we live. Ironically, when we went to the Bahamas, one of the things that was made clear to us was that those houses, for example, that survived the furor of Dorian were those that were traditionally built to suit the purposes of the island in which they were being built. In other words, those that were on stilts that could withstand the storm surge. And I ask myself, therefore, why is it that our foreparents never had to get ready? It was because they had always to be ready, because they did not have the luxury of forewarning. And therefore, they had to build for the climate within which they lived. And that is all that I'm asking us to do, because regrettably, in addition to the changes to the flat roofs, a number of designs that look pretty were all of a sudden imported without thought or analysis in too many of our circumstances in middle and upper middle income housing because that's how television and film portrayed it without recognizing that it not, did not suit our purposes. If we move to the middle income bungalow that was built traditionally in this country once again, we see a house design that was faithful to ventilation. And we see a house design that was faithful to the circumstances within which we live and a roof design, a hip roof more often than not, that was faithful to the circumstances which we face as an island that is only 166 square miles in the middle of the ocean. Now when you consider that wind speeds are topping <laughs> our own size, you begin to understand why there is this urgency. So my friends, many of you I know have addressed this issue in conversation and in some instances design already. So I'm not asking you to go where no man has gone. 
or where no woman has gone. But I am asking you to treat this as a matter of national priority. Um, governments don't only legislate, but governments persuade and lead the way. We have a massive housing program to undertake very shortly. We've also said that we will work with the people of Rock Hall and other areas in order to appropriately relocate them and to build for the times. We're also conscious that as much as we want to prepare, if we don't balance that with the needs of what it takes to earn us our living, which is still tourism, international business, that we will not be able to pay to continue so that there has to be a balance between the risk that we take and what it is that we admit of and what it is we will work against. There will always be coastal building, but the coastal building has to take into account what are the risks. I'm happy that with the help of the Inter-American Development Bank, we have a wonderful tool, the ENCRIP, the National Coastal Risk Assessment that allows us to map our hazards, our risk, and determine our vulnerability, whether it is to storm surge, whether it is to um, geological issues, whether it is to wind, whatever it is, it allows us in almost a micro way to determine, for example, that commercially, the commercial buildings in Fontabelle, to give you an example, are more likely to be subject to wind hazards rather than flooding because of the manner in which, even though a large part of Bridgetown is below sea level, those buildings have been built, I'm told, sufficiently high off the road that flooding is not the immediate issue there as it would be just a stone's throw away in Murphy's Pasture, um, where we're now working, hopefully, to resolve and make that risk a thing of the past. We have taken lightly these things which can undermine our stability, undermine our competitiveness for too long. And I'm signaling with this consultation this morning the intention, therefore, of this government to have a strategic interjection to change how we have been building for the last 55 years and to bring us to a point where we control our environment by building not just for the climate, but also for the times in which we live with respect to sustainable living and renewable energy and access to water. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I look forward to your remarks and consultations. I say this, we're not starting with a green field. We're starting with a country that has houses. And therefore, we have a dual approach. We need new designs, but we also need a clear process recommended to government as to how we will strengthen those existing roofs in particular and deal with the water tanks are obviously easier for us to deal with, but then also to look at the best forms of renewable energy for chattel houses that may not be able to carry the weight of a substantive structure with respect to photovoltaic panels, etc. And are we not looking at either some form of community grid or are we looking at some form of wind, small wind um, energy that doesn't carry the same structure? I don't know. You all are the experts at construction, and I look forward to receiving our duty once we have and agree to what we are going to do. Then our duty is to be able to find the resources and, if necessary, pass the legislation that will make it happen. Bermuda made certain decisions with respect to its roof and stock particularly because of water and because of where it is in the middle of the ocean 
anybody who has been to Bermuda, Bermuda is 14 miles by one mile, so that they did not have a choice. It is within our power to make this change, but we need you to be able to advise on it, and hence this consultation this morning. Um, the RFP, as I said, will go out, and I would expect and that we should hopefully have that RFP close with actual designs we want submitted for us to assess. Why? Because we are going to have to start, as I said, some public housing very shortly, and we want to be able to test it out with what we start and to modify as we go along to make sure that those who need access to that common standard plan for low-income housing will have access to it without having to pay. The last point I want to make is this. There is no legislative authority for the building standards authority that has been around for what, over 10 years? 15 years. And it is largely because the country has been flirting with the possibility of a tyrannical bureaucracy about to be imposed on them. I'm not an engineer, but I'm a lawyer. And I understand the concept of shifting the burden of proof. And I understand the concept, therefore, of us asking those professionals, particularly working above a certain level in terms of value and square footage, to accept responsibility for the work which they have done, in which case the shifting of the burden of proof will allow us to be able to let you agree to the certification, but with us building authority that therefore will do audits to ensure that what you have certified is what you have certified and with the appropriate penalties for those who have either misled or failed to do what they're supposed to do. But if we try to certify every single one and inspect every single building, effectively we would grind construction to a halt in this country. And that is why I suspect Successive governments have never brought into law the legislation necessary to underpin the Building Standards Authority. Well, we can't ignore the public purpose that it serves. And those who have been listening to us for the last year will know that in every instance I ask us to ask four questions. What is the public purpose that we are trying to achieve? What is the public mischief that we're trying to avert? Does technology allow us a more effective and efficient way to do what we're doing? And can we do it, or in doing it, can we empower a class of people, or can we stop the discrimination that may be existing for a class of person? When I do that, it is clear to me that the same approach that we've taken to applications to the Immigration Department through legislation that we're going to do, I'm waiting for the legislation um, from the Ministry of Education with respect to the Accreditation Council, same thing, where you shift the burden of proof to the applicant so that the applicant can certify and through audits, you are then able to make sure that things move smoothly, but in the event that people are playing the fool or misleading or lying, then they have to show cause why their permit should not be revoked. Um, and we are about to do the same thing with the Customs Department with the Trusted Traders Program, which will allow us for the large traders in Barbados to become and to claim the status of trusted trader. But if you step on the crease once, you'll be warned. By the second time or the third time, you will have action and you will lose the status of being a trusted trader and all of the benefits that flow with it. We have to find a similar framework for the Building Standards Authority. And we need to do that so that the Attorney General who is with us will be in a position to certify legislation no later than the beginning of the hurricane season next year. 
before June 1st next year that will give us a sustainable framework with teeth for the Building Standards Authority, but one that does not, by the same token, grind to a halt all construction in this country. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and I look forward to your intervention today as being a pivotal intervention in the development of this country and in the building of resilience for Barbados. Let this be a day that we reflect. One year ago, regrettably, we entered an IMF program. Today, we are taking control of our destiny, and we are not waiting for anybody to tell us to do it. We are doing it because whether we like it or not, we are the first port of call, potentially, for that thing called hurricane terror. Thank you. Prime Minister, thank you for your pearls of wisdom. We have paid very close attention to what you've been saying as it relates to climate change, disaster resilience, and I'm sure most of us gathered in this room, we heard your presentations last week to the United Nations and the, and the, um, the Inter-American Development Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning, we have gathered here a wide cross-section of persons who are in the construction industry. We have architects, engineers, contractors, artisans. We have the insurance jobs persons. We have material suppliers and, importantly, members of the general public. And we have a series of presentations for you this morning. The presentations will be short, but we want to ensure that there is significant feedback. We have a rapporteur who is capturing all of the discussions so that we can put together not only a very powerful report, but some, a report that can guide, can guide policy. So without further ado, I invite the director of the Building Standards Authority, Mr. Emil Trotman, to come forward and make a presentation on building for resilience. And those of us who are seated at the head table, we will we will go down to the reserve table so we can see Mr. Trotman's presentation along with the others. Mr. Trotman. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. About, we'll be going through about 20 slides, and after the slides, we'll be doing um, be a question time.
Right, this is just the introduction. Um, the specimens for block work houses and timber frame houses. The maximum um, floor area for timber houses for a... Right, the maximum floor area is up to 3,000 square feet. And for small buildings, uh, 5,000 square feet. A minimum roof slope of 30 degrees. Uh, maximum roof span is 28 feet for block work houses. And for timber houses, you have a um, maximum roof span is 24 feet, 40 feet long. A maximum wind speed of 30, 130 miles an hour. There's, um, there are details for earthquake resistance to comply with cubic code, intended to facilitate artisans, and small contractors, site inspections by owners, cost effective construction of houses and small buildings. The details would be, as you see some of them over there, they are already fabricated so persons can see what they're supposed to do. The contractor will know what he's supposed to build, so does the artisan. The, the owner knows what he or she's supposed to see, and the inspector knows what he's supposed to see as well. Okay. These are details that we have assembled for the construction of houses and small buildings, right? And, and the purpose, this is the, second, the purpose of this consultation, because if not, we're going to get people coming now to say what should have been. This is just a guide for discussion for what must be the new norm. And what a, because there will immediately be discussion as to whether 130 miles per hour is what we should be building for in this day when we know that there is likely to be higher speeds. And we have to balance that back out against affordability and other issues. But what I don't want, because none of this is captured in law at this point in time, we have the luxury of settling nationally the new norm for what we should be building to. So I don't want you to jump into Mr. Trotman and to attack him in circumstances where all he has done is to facilitate the discussion for us in a structured way. Thank you. You may continue, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, the details shown here is for a footing, um, for a wall house, for block work, and just two layers of reinforcement. The, the, there's a corner, the T-junction detail, where you have an external wall and an internal wall. It could be two internal walls. It depends on where, this is, where, where, where you have the, um, where the detail occurs. This one is for a corner detail. Again, you have to see the reinforcing bars. See the reinforcing bars. This is a tie. And at every, um, every this occurs every three courses, and you have um, either, either uh, that will be brick force in these, in these courses, or you will have uh, mild steel. This is a detail for a child house, a footing for a child house, where you see there'll be a pad, say about two, two inches thick. And this is, these are block work piers up to about four feet in height. And this is a timber beam, and this spans about six feet between, well, the distance between the piers is about six feet. This is another, this is another view of the same detail. This is the detail here showing the, um, where, where the stud meets the, um, the, the stud meets the sole plate. And then the sole plate is bolted to the con to a concrete beam, which is then on blocks, which goes down to the foundation. This is plywood sheathing, which would tend to provide um, rigidity and stiffness to the house. That would be a timber frame house. This is a similar detail. There's a corner detail. There are bars you can't see. There are ties that. So it shows a stud being tied to the, to the corner post. This, this is called a guy nail plate. Um, I think we discussed if ACE, what, that they will bring the, import these. And then you have hurricane straps. You can't see here on the far side that comes down embedded in the concrete beam. And these are 20 millimeter bolts. They occur at corners. They occur every, about every 900 meters. They occur, 900 millimeters, sorry, three feet. And they also occur at window and door openings. I just said window and door openings and where, each, um, where the seal ends, where the sole plate ends. This is a, this is a detail where the, where, the, where the ring beam, the rafter, meets the, um, meets the block work wall, the external wall, the eaves. And what you see here, there's a, this, this is a strap 
that comes around is embedded under this uh, mending plate and it goes down into the concrete beam. They be beam fill and this is, a, um, this is a mending plate on either side and then you have a throw bar to resist horizontal thrust at the eaves. The eaves do not only have uplift where the hurricane tries to pull it off, they also tend to see the hurricane to push it this way. You get a thrust and this tends to resist the thrust. What you notice here, you have metal on metal. This is another detail quickly where you have the um, corner detail for uh, at, the, at the gable end. Um, two of these, the views the same, just opposing views of the same detail. You have the top rails, you have the, the that's the gable rafter, and these are, these are just ties which will occur probably three feet along here, along the length of the, of the rafter collar. And this stops the, the lower edge of the rafter of the gable end being blown out. This is, this is the hip roof detail. Similar detail, they have four members coming together. One, two, three, four, the stud, the rafter, and the two corner, and the two corner, um, the top rails. And this is a, this is a strap type of corner to hold the corner in shape. And these are the hurricane straps. They're available for viewing on the other side. This is, this is the same view. This is a, another view of this, so I won't repeat myself there. Right. This is typical way a rafter meets the top rail. Again, it's the same kind of, similar kind of detail. You have this is called a diaphragm cord. This, this is fixed to the, stop, to the top rail. Then the ceiling, the ceiling is nailed to the underside of this. And this is the stud. And this is a sheathing which is kind of new. We don't do this in Barbados, but this is provide a stiffening element for timber frame houses that along with the ceiling provide a, a, a rigid, um, rigid design. Some people might consider using bracing, but I don't think bracing would work for those type of wind speeds. This is, a, this is where, the, where the rafter meets the top at the ridge, at the ridge board. Um, again, it, you can be, it can be viewed over there. This is the hip roof joint, hip, hip roof joint, right. What happens here is that usually these, all these members just tacked together by nails. We have come up with a detail where everything is, um, where, the, where, the, where the ridge board and the king rafter are joined by, main, by uh, gang nail plates and then the pieces just framing and we use um, hurricane straps. This is another view of the same thing. All this here shows really is the, this is a case where you have close boarding and you have a, um, a button, roof button, which the, port, which the sheeting is, near, is fixed to. And this is a detail where you have a blue screw. It's on a, on a washer, three millimeter thick washer, but it's one millimeter by an inch square that's uh, screwed through the rafter, through, this, um, the, through the, um, the plywood, and into the Purple Heart. Um, okay, went too quickly just now. Um, this is this is um, this just shows the end where the fascia boards, the lower fascia board, upper fascia board, and the last purling meets. This is another view of the same thing. Ah, right. What you're seeing here is where the rafter comes down. This is a fascia board, the lower fascia board, upper fascia board, last purling. And what we have done here is we provide, normally this, the problem with this detail, usually that this bottom raft, this bottom fascia board is nailed in to the end grain of the, of the timber, which is not a good finish. Um, so what happened is that we have introduced a, a button which is nailed, this is nailed to this, and then the lower fascia board is nailed to this, and then everything just comes along as it normally would. This shows a purling. Um, a purling fixed to the fixed to the rafter. Some people lay the purlings flat, um, but this is a strong axis of purling. But you can lay it flat depending on what what the what you what you're laying it on. If you're laying it on a pitch pine, you will have to put these purlings that closer together. Mm. This. My apologies. Right, this is where you have what's called the outlooker, where the rafter, where the, the, there's at the eaves, not the eaves, at the gable end, usually this outlooker, this is the last rafter, called, and then you have this called an outlooker. And we put a strap across here, down the side and under, and then this is nailed into, um, nailed into the, um, this outlooker is nailed into the, the gable rafter, and this is called a tie-back, 45 degree tie-back, 
these occur probably every three feet down the slope. And this is the top, this is to prevent the top part of the, of the gable end from toppling over. This is basically the same thing. Again, you're seeing the same thing here. It's just, um, this better explains it with the two, um, with the two fascia boards at the gable end. Okay, this is just some pictures I'll show you. This is where a roof, where the rafters, where the rafters snapped. Um, this one is where, again, the, the gable end, the gable wall blew out, and then the rafters, it was a stir, was everything went, went wrong. This is where an uh, uh, entire two-story house toppled. I guess it wasn't bolted well, but it was um, this two-story house, you see, they're going to topple it over. And then the last one, this is, a, again, this was a disaster. Everything went wrong. Um, before we entertain any questions, I'll just say quickly that the, that, the, that the details we just showed you are for um, fits traditional construction in Barbados, how we normally build. They facilitate self-help where people get their brother-in-law or whatever to help, and the people build incrementally. They build with blocks or they build with um, timber frame, and it provides for a timber frame roof on a, on, a, on a concrete roof beam, and then the roof beam is on block work walls. Um, block work walls we recommend here to be eight inches thick, and then the block work walls go onto a floor, and then the floor is transferred down to the foundation. In case of a timber frame house, we have just, um, we take what traditionally done and we just try to strengthen it by using hurricane straps and in this case, a sheathing and a ceiling. Um, it does not prevent persons, prohibit persons from using alternative designs. These designs are not, as the Prime Minister said, these are not fixed. If a person, if a, through, through the use of an engineer, these can be altered, but these are supposed to be the minimum. Um, but they can be altered, of course, and they could also be alternative designs. For example, use a modular design or you can use a, a bit of modular and a C2 construction. Um, any questions, please? All right, thank you for that presentation, Emil. We're going to open the floor for questions and discussion, but we, for the purposes of our note taking, just ask you to identify yourself and the company where you're from um, so that we can have that reflected in our note of this meeting. Uh, good morning. My name is Bruce Jardine. I'm here representing the Barbados Institute of Architects. Um, I've had the opportunity to go over these details with Emil a couple of days ago, and there were a few concerns that had brought up, um, but this is not meant to be a criticism of what he's done. I think that what he has come up with is a good start for, as Prime Minister has said, uh, discussion. Um, my main concern, or one of my main concerns with this, uh, we had discussed the use of Purple Heart. Um, everybody in Barbados knows that uh, Purple Heart is resistant to termites. Unfortunately, the termites don't know that. So my recommendation, you know, for low-income housing, people are not going to be able to afford the termite treatment, and they're not going to be able to afford the ongoing every two or three years to retreat the exterior of the house. Especially if you're building a house on piers, um, there's no protection for the termite treatment underneath the building and any water getting under there. In our wisdom, we now use a termite treatment that is water soluble and therefore it washes away very quickly. Um, the old treatments used to bind with the soil, but they cause cancer, so nobody uses them anymore. Uh, termite treatment, I think, is or termite-treated timbers, I think, are essential if we're going to be using timber. The other main concern I had with this um, proposal is cost. Uh, I also am a very big fan of Barbados' history, just like the Prime Minister, and I've looked at, you know, housing down the line. Um, Housing was mentioned in the very first history of Barbados by Richard Ligon. He was under the impression that he couldn't understand why Barbadians built their houses with limited ventilation, slab windows, and they had so much what they called kill devil or rum inside the house, he was wondering why they didn't spontaneously explode. 
the Prime Minister also noted that we have these beautiful child houses which are our tradition, and she noted them as low-income houses. I would just like to correct her. Low-income housing was not a beautiful child house. That was an emerging lower income or lower middle class housing after money came back from Panama and helped to develop these beautiful houses we, st we see. That money helped go into um, small businesses, corner shops, and the revenue from that then developed the beautiful child house we see today. Low income housing in those days didn't have lovely ventilation, didn't have lovely roofs, you may have had a trash roof, you would have had slab windows, you would have had limited, no ventilation, and everybody would have had to have lived outside except for at night when you went inside to, live, to sleep. Cost, therefore, is my second major comment on what I've seen here today. Um, building stock has developed over time, and we've gone from building with wattle and dab and into when timber became available out of North America, at a reasonable price, we've started building with timber. Timber is now not a cheap material as compared to block work. To build a timber building, it is almost the same cost as building with six inch concrete block work. I am not a quantity bearer. I, this is what I've heard from other quantity bearers. And uh, we're proposing that we build buildings up to 24 feet wide, 40 feet long in timber using the structures and the methods that I see here is going to put these buildings to the cost limit now of an eight inch concrete block work wall. And an eight inch concrete block work wall is going to last much better than a timber building, especially if it's untreated. So yes, a lot of these details with the straps and whatever are essential for reno or retrofitting existing timber buildings. But if we're going to be talking about small buildings up to 24 feet wide and 40 feet long as a small building, then my recommendation is that we do not recommend that that be built out of timber, that that be built out of concrete, which is now going to be the new building norm. Like I say, we built with wattle and dab, we built with whatever we could. Um, people who could afford it in the past built the coral stone block work, whereas people who couldn't built with timber We've gone past that now, and we've come to the stage now where we are building buildings with concrete block work. We have precast concrete, which is much thinner, um, but gives the fire rating that you would want and gives the structural protection that everybody will require. There are other methods of construction now. And my concern with building with timber and coming up with these proposals um, I think we need to actually get the quantity of errors involved to see what the most cost-effective method of building. Um, I like a lot of these details you have, but I think they do need to be refined. And again, I would like to have it that the architects and engineers, when they're designing buildings, that these not be mandatory, but that the architects and engineers be allowed to design so long as everything is properly engineered to suit what is required. So my questions are not really questions, they're more comments. Um, I am preparing a response to the met our office on Friday. We had a discussion. I would say it a number of things. Um, the problem of termites, um, as I, I told you, you have to treat the site. Even if you have pitch pine, which is treated, you, the pine still has to be cut. The cut ends of the, of, the, of the pitch pine will still be volumes of termites. So as I said to you, um, you will have to termite treat the site as best as the manufacturer would specify in his, um, in his, in his um, details. In the specification on the, on the, for the for treatment of the site. The other matter in terms of timber houses. Remember a lot of timber houses, particularly child houses, are, are built on rented land. The land does not belong to the owner. To the, to the, the house owner. Sometimes you get situations where the tenant, the house owner, and the land owner are three different people. And that's so particular around the city. So the need to have the timber houses will always be with us until, unless that is changed. Uh, as I said earlier, as far as the details are concerned, if an engineer, if, if, the engine, if alternatives can be provided, provided the engineer um, uh, uh, vouch for them, and that's, that's, that's what we intend here. I don't think. 
I respond to you every, every point. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Abdul Pando from Professional Engineering Services, and I'm a structural engineer. Amy, what concerns me, all your details, every single item is imported, every single item. I want to challenge, like the hurricane straps even are molded, ready done. Can't we challenge our local people to make hurricane straps. Can't we use old body parts from the old buses? You know, something, um, give employment and have some indigenous input into your timber houses. I think this is very important. Another thing I want you to look at a detail, which my mentor, the late Louis Redman, was very fond of, but we couldn't get it implemented for, for various reasons. The existing timber houses are all timber houses. Consider it, I'm not saying it's a solution, but consider it that you put a concrete footing and then put a steel bar, run it up and just run it over the main supports for your roof. That alone will substantially increase the hurricane resistance of any timber house. This is my feeling, and I think we need to do research. Pardon me? You take any house, what happens to the roof? The tension of the wood, the timber cannot take the tension. Steel is very good in, in tension. So therefore, if you can put a little footing and put the steel, a steel bar, half inch steel bar, for example, go right up and then get it lap over the main, the main supports of the roof. Either put a boat through it and wrap it around and put it at the four corners or six of them. You will substantially improve the structures. For old buildings too, it can do in all the buildings, I think so. I, I'm saying it's something I want to consider. Louis Redmond, I, I think you know Louis Redmond. Louis Redmond was very fond of this detail. Very fond, but we never... Probably with good reason, and Louis was a good man and would have known it. Yeah. One of the things, look, we, we can choose to have multiple projects, but the government has chosen to have an approach to, a capital, to its capital projects as different. And it is that, in a very real way, we have 10, 15 years to change how we do things. Okay, Mr. Phillips is here. We took your advice, you didn't know it, with respect to the wells that the NHC are now looking, well covers, etc. Because this government does not believe that it is omnipotent nor omniscient. One of the things that we want to do is to strengthen the existing housing stock, recognizing that everybody obviously cannot go and build new houses. And therefore, as we put a new standard for new build, we have to have an approach for the existing houses that we have. If not, we're not going to succeed. In fairness, and I see a representative from Inatech here, Mr. De Silva came and showed us potential for a house roof that could be done for existing houses that I'd like to be peer reviewed that can be built largely off site because that's the other problem that you're dealing with with low income housing and, and I take the point that the chattel houses were more lower middle income and that's why I've said that we're looking for standards for both low income and lower middle income but if you build it off-site, because the persons who live in the house cannot afford to go and move out somewhere. 
So you need minimal time for construction in order to minimize the dislocation to the people in the house. And that if you brought it and then you put the panels and hold the top of the roof, not a construction person, with a piece of steel or whatever, and the pitch. I listened to Emil just now, Mr. Trotman, and wondered whether 30 degrees was sufficient, but I'm just a lay person. And what is the traditional pitch for the traditional Barbadian house? 45, that's what I thought. But, but 30 also is ugly. <laughs> it is. You understand? <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. And that, but I just tell you, it's still ugly. <laughs> so we have to come up with a new form that balances all of the different things, from cost to aesthetics to functionality to rigidity and, and, and strength. Um, but I'm saying to you that in addition to Mr. Redmond's suggestion, which you have so kindly shared with us, I'd also like us to have a peer review done of what Inatech has, uh, Mr. De Silva had proposed, because we need to find ways of being able to deal with existing houses. Now, part of the difficulty, and a lot of those who work with urban and rural will tell us, is that in some instances, the existing structure can't take a new roof, and therefore you're looking at a new bill in some instances. And then I've heard all of you speak about timber and eight inch blocks. But when I leave here and go in Liquid Village or go in um, Bushall or go in another part of the country, I see people build with what? Concrete boards. So that the population has already determined what they believe to be affordable. Now, the question I have, therefore, for you as a structural engineer and the rest of you in here is. Is concrete board the way to go? And if it isn't, why are we encouraging our people to build in this way, which is like putting money in Maxwell Pond? Can concrete, I respond, please? Concrete board is a, is a good material, but it needs supporting. You have to get, there are two types of concrete board as well. This is what I don't think we understand here. There's the external concrete board and is the internal concrete board. The stores here bring in one type and everybody build it on the external and the internal. Which means that we are firm people. So we need to have a we, standard. We need to, yeah, if you read the literature, there's external, people. there's concrete board for external uses. But concrete board... And which is, one is being brought into the country? I, I, the cheaper one. <laughs> but, and can I... Oh. Sorry, sorry. Emil, you want if, I, if I can respond to a few things being said. Mm -hmm. um, to answer your question, Bruce, I did get Quantiveers in our office to do a cost comparison between using our details and using f what he did for traditional um, child house. And he came up for cost difference about uh, $4,336.91. So I don't think it's that big a disparity. I mean, I the, dis the difference in cost between a... Uh, but Mr. Trotman, you can, what I think they're trying to tell you is that don't put that cost out there without the supporting evidence because you can just get kicked out. No, our, but our, our the purpose, I think your purpose is to show that even if there is a slight increase in cost, it is manageable. Now, we don't know it. I haven't seen it either. And as Minister of Finance, I'd like to see it because I may have to make certain determinations as to how I can help offset or balance. But at the same time, I accept that there has to be a conversation with the public because it's no sense building something that is not going to last anything at all or any time. So we may have some cost issues, but we have to keep it within the zone of affordability even if there's going to be a slight increase. Now, I can maybe agree that for low-income housing, there are different ways in which I can do strategic targeting, which will have to be a separate conversation from here. But what I want us to get right today, first and foremost, is what are the things we ought to be taking into account and that we ought to be judging the RFP against when the designs come in that we will go out for. Um, 
And notice that we're doing this an RFP for the initial public housing that we're building. That doesn't mean the rest of you can't do other things, but we feel that we need to find a way of testing and beginning to have the conversation that focuses the entire industry in this way. And then what we do need consensus from, from you where possible, and if not, we'll have to choose from competing views, is on this issue of how to stabilize the existing housing stock that we have, because we are still in one season, and we are nine months away from the start of the next season. Yeah. So that's the urgency. I would like to add one more thing here. Um, the cost of different, I would be one's a very working out this cost. Government must take the initiative, national housing especially, and build certain models and costing. I remember in 1976, there was always this confusion of which is cheaper, a galvanized roof, concrete roof. I was saying a concrete roof was cheaper at that time. Somebody would say a galvanized roof timber roof, you know, all kinds of materials. And I remember Mr. Simmons, Sir David, who is now Sir David, was the chairman, and told me, Abdul, let's talk all this talk. Take six lots in Freehill, build all the roofs. Everybody will build it and itemize each course. And then you come up with, what's the thing? We can sit down here and let all the conservators work with everything. And we did that at Freehill. It never no, but no one pursued it after Mr. Simmons and I left National Housing. But we need this kind of approach where government tries out different things. We can talk as much as we want unless we do the actual physical. Because cost relates to which contractor is building something. If somebody has cheaper to buy concrete blocks, the concrete blocks can be cheaper. If he well, can get timber wood. Once they don't have a lot of steel in it. Huh? <laughs> well, <laughs> so it has... A, a, you have to have practical, a practical approach and physical and, and approach. Honestly, that's what we're trying to do. So that we know that we have to start government's housing program with respect to dealing not just with the squatters, but I announced that we want a massive housing intervention for people in this country earning below $4,000. And why? I have seen too many shanty houses constructed in the last decade. When young men and young women reach 20 and 21 and 22, they're not necessarily working, but they're full adults, and the parents tell them not in here, and that you have to get out or that they're quarreling, and what next happens because they can't afford to go and rent or do their own thing, they end up building a little one-room shanty in the yard, and I can carry you all through Barbados now it is why in the next room a year ago, 18 months ago, because we weren't in government then, we heard from the IDB poverty survey that in truth and in fact the number of pit toilets in the country had increased. Now, we are committed to removing that from our landscape, but equally we have to be committed to setting the standards that people can build something that will last and not will go when the high income. One other point I would like to make is that most of our detailing, especially foundation details, it's the same thing if you've been a low income house and if you've been in a house in Sandy Lane. It's, it's time the young engineers are challenged to come up with different foundation designs. But especially in low income houses, um, what you have to do is come up with economical design, but you must realize that if you build a, with a certain kind of design, if you build a hundred houses, maybe you will get a few minor cracks in two or three, but that's better than having to go down 15 feet into a walk and dig like, oh, you, you will build a, a, an expensive house. So you have to come up with details, but you must be aware of the consequences. Sometimes it's better to build a hundred houses and two might have a little fault, you remedy them, but at a cheaper cost for low-income housing than to use the same massive details that want 100% uh, performance. Thank you very much. All right, thank you for that discussion. Are we going to keep those thoughts right there? Um, just a bit of housekeeping matters. Just like to you know, welcome 
Ministers of Environment and Housing. Um, the team at LESC has told us that some of us may be blocking the exits. So if this is your car number, we kindly ask you to find another parking space. Um, XA363, XG269, S5656, PA3509, SA242, X9272, M5622, A1007, XA4260, G8355, MH4427, P47, T1190, XB652. You're apparently blocking the exits, the fire exits. If there's a fire, we are in danger. So kindly oblige us with removing your vehicle. Okay, as we move on to the next, and some of you are actually moving, are you guilty? Okay, so we're keeping this, this conversation in focus. Um, the, the lead up to where we are now is a collaboration between the Ministry of Housing and Lands and the Ministry of Transport, inspired by the Prime Minister. Um, and the discussion up to this point has been a bit tenuous. So, and I'm happy the Prime Minister told us to get to the point because the next presentation is from uh, Mr. Trevor Brown, the president of the Association of Professional Engineers. And um, we've had a lot to, dis to, to discuss already, and I'm sure his point of view is something we would all want to hear. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Brown. Okay, Mr. Master Ceremony, Honorable Prime Minister. Ministers of Government, building professionals, ladies and gentlemen. The Barbados Association of Professional Engineers, uh, we are particularly happy to, be, to have been invited to participate in this, uh, what we consider to be a very important session, dealing with um, building infrastructure resilience, especially doing so in the face of what appears to be a growing, a growing global era of turmoil. Before, before I go into my substantive short presentation, and I know said boy says short and then they just say what they have to say, so I plan to do that too. I'd just like to make two very, very quick points. Um, based on the discussion led by Emil, it is BAP's position that given the current materials available to us in, in the 21st century and the knowledge and experience of our various building professionals in Barbados, there are, in fact, as the Prime Minister said very clearly, multiple options available for low-income building that will actually be cost-effective and resilient. I mean, we live in a world now where what many, many options are available. The issue is not the actual specific design, so don't let's get to carry it. The issue is one of minimal minimum acceptable standards. This is what we need to establish. So you can have all kinds of designs. The question is, what is the minimum acceptable standard that we will take in Barbados given the circumstances in terms of threats to our infrastructure and the growing global warming threats that we face that has obviously the sense now show is a real reality. The other point I want to make is that this is the, the, uh, in response to a suggestion from the PM that one of the factors in the clearly increased exposure of low-income housing is, quote-unquote, the professional costs that we need to go into building at the appropriate standard. I would like to humbly suggest that without any question, the lack of minimum standards in the form of a mandatory building code is the true culprit. And in fact, once those codes are in place, and given the quality of professionals that we have, the availability of material, and the history of building, it is actually quite possible and quite feasible to have extremely competitive costs, professional costs, for low-income housing that provides exactly the kind of results that we actually want. So I just want to touch on those two briefly. No one now seriously questions the fact. And I will probably take a slightly different slant to what we had this morning, so I ask you to forgive me for that. I'll try not to go too long. But no one seriously questions now the fact that our world's climate has taken a turn to the extreme. 
Recent monster hurricanes that exceed the established measurement charts, reaching unprecedented levels of size, deadliness, and destructiveness in record time, have been completely in sync with other extremes that we have been seeing across this whole world. And this goes from the Japanese tsunami and earthquake all the way to unbelievable wildfires in un unimaginable places, including the Amazon, to flooding, unbelievable droughts, and even here in Barbados, unexpected temperature extremes. Even President Trump is now probably seeing that we are into a whole new reality in this world. From our perspective at BAP, there are four main issues that we think we in Barbados need to urgently consider. The first one is risk management, a new look at risk management in light of our clearly new and dangerous reality. The second issue is one of building infrastructural resilience, and I'm speaking in, term, in 2020 terms. No, we need a renewed and critical focus on things like having a hospital that will survive extreme situations, a water system that can be back online as soon as possible, and building up front proactively into such systems that they can recover from, ex from possible very serious situations. And the same thing goes, of course, for the power system. And also, retrofitting our existing stock in the face of the clear growing threats. So infrastructure resilience is clearly a major priority. But we also need to look seriously at our disaster response preparedness. There are, and there have been countries, including the US, in recent months and years, that thought they would have been prepared and thought that they were ready and had available resources nearby and still had very, very serious challenges after impacts. Barbados is a small island. We are located in an isolated place, miles away from our nearest neighbors, currently unable to feed ourselves, or indeed to be self-sufficient in many me measurable ways. Um, our structural engineer, Abdul, just mentioned the fact that even in, in the, the strengthening, the, the, the materials for strengthening, everything is important. We are very, very exposed. We need to look seriously at our disaster response preparedness. It cannot be take, we cannot do, it cannot be something that we just hope we will never have to use. The last point of my four points that I really, and the most important by far, is that we need to take a new proactive management approach in this new reality to dealing with the issues that confront us. And I'm talking about quality management a situation where quality becomes the major driving focus in everything we do. I'll talk a little bit about that. As I said, Barbados is located in a tropical storm beltway. We have had major impacts in the past. It can happen again in the future. We are also potentially exposed to things like earthquake activity, tsunami, if we believe in kicking Jenny, Volcanic activity, we, very, we, are, we have many neighbors who are very known active volcano sites, and unknown communicable diseases and other dangers to which we can be specially exposed because of our tourist nature. The records clearly indicate that extreme weather is a serious growing cycle, resulting in rising sea levels, extreme weather events, impacting health, agriculture, productivity, and tourism, increase insurance costs, and reduce responsiveness. And I, 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 put, I am putting it to you that given the current circumstances, when and if we do get an input, uh, uh, impact, there's a very high likelihood of reduced responsiveness from international community after disaster. Because if it happens in Dominica, Bahamas, Bermuda, all over the place, when it happens to us, it, it, it's just going to be, a, OK, we're too bad. You know, we'll see what we can do. You're not going to get the kind of response that we got 10, 15 years ago. We need to be a lot more self-sufficient, and I'm very happy that the Prime Minister has said very clearly that the new approach is going to be very, we will take responsibility for ourselves and put things in place to make sure that we are ready. So, 
We are in a Barbados in 2020, almost, where building codes are not enforced by law and have not been for the last 40 years. Many attempts have been made. All have been frustrated by, for various reasons. Many of them sounding really good when they happen. In the interest mainly of minimizing building costs, some would say in the misguided interest of minimizing business costs. We've heard over and over today that for every dollar you spend proactively and wisely, of course, you save at least $4 down the road in rebuilding costs. And that, a, a simple look at our sewers project would actually show that, but I don't want to go, that's a different story altogether. So building quality in upfront is clearly, clearly worth it. And having minimum standards for something as important as our building and our infrastructure, nothing can be more important. Importantly, our public service has moved from one where some years ago, you could be guaranteed that there were a number of highly qualified, internationally rated professionals, especially engineers, who personally, because of their professionalism and their position at the time, enforce standards in the way we build. I mean, Nikki C. comes to mind at the Waterworks, Trevor Clark, um, Frank McConney, people who personally use their professionalism to impose standards. For some interesting reason, we have moved away from this. We have de-emphasized professionalism. And we have reduced standards as a result. No one is to blame. It is just the fact. But it is a serious and a dangerous fact. As a result of this, no one now can tell you the true level of resilience of our national infrastructure at this moment. Most of us, in engineering at least, and in, I'm sure in some of the other professions, are of the opinion that having gone and tested for now a whole generation, we in Barbados are particularly unprepared. Careful analysis of damage sustained during recent nearby hurricanes clearly shows that properties built to specify codes have sustained significantly reduced damage when compared to similar properties not built to code. Minimum codes and standards work. While it is true that there's probably no practical building code that could have withstood the onslaught that Doreen brought to the Bahamas, no one can question that the que casualty impact, had there been no standards there, would have been even worse than we see today. Were there no codes in place in, Bah in Bahamas? But even if we were to close the door today, even if by a stroke of the pen, the Prime Minister could enact a law that makes mandatory building code effective as of four o'clock this afternoon, the horse is already out of the stable and, and galloping. We actually needed to be building to code over the last 40 years if we were to be prepared today. A new building code now will definitely make a difference and is needed. It will make a difference in about 2030, 2040, when we build new stock to code. So at this stage, there are a number of other things that we need to focus on over and above protecting our children's infrastructure. We need to strengthen existing infrastructure as a matter of priority. We need to make sure that what we do have now which may well have been built outside of code, something is put in place to systematically bring that infrastructure within some level of code so that we at least know what we can expect in given circumstances in Barbados. We need to urgently build disaster response capabilities with the understanding that this is a, this is a needed requirement in the new environment in which we have found ourselves. We need to be prepared to respond to serious situations. We can no longer hope that things will go away. 
we need proper shelters. In the short term, it may not be realistic to think that 100,000 low-income houses in Barbados can be retrobuilt in two years. We may well have to think in terms of a number of strong houses, safe houses, being put in place so that people in communities in extreme circumstances, unfortunately we get good warning now so you can actually do that, can actually go to a safe house and then we can protect life and limb and then we can, that may be something that we may have to look at in the interim. The fact is that we are into a new reality. We need secure storehouses for supplies. We have seen the, the, the problems of just not having simple things like a bottle of water or just something to eat. Something that, you, that, that was not a problem two days before and after a serious event becomes a life and death situation. We can plan ahead with the expectation that should this happen, we do have some reserves in place. And we also need to have some proper professional trained response teams in place to do a number of things. One, to guide the retrofitting, to guide the decisions that we need to take, and also to respond in the event that some untoward event does in fact occur. But most importantly, and if there's only one thing I said this morning, this is what I would like it to be. Most urgently needed will be a new culture of proactive, results-driven management that is built around quality standards and world-class performance. Let me, I want to say a couple of things about quality, right? I don't know if you understand the importance of quality. Quality is the most critical requirement in this century in achieving success. Everything else is practically meaningless. In the old days, if you had lots of money, you had a good chance of achieving success because there are a lot of people who didn't have access to money. But the truth is, in this world, with the kind of financial services we have, practically anyone can have access to money if you have the right ideas and the right vision and, and the other things. So money is no longer a deciding factor in success. Okay, no problem. I, I actually close the end of them. Quality is about doing things right the first time, which is what we need to do. We need, we need to, I, I would like us to spend a lot more emphasis on that. And then it's not accepting mediocrity. Unless quality becomes central philosophy driving our national strategies and focus, success will continue to elude us. So, the last, my last point, we need to do a serious strategic risk management analysis given our new circumstances and our present circumstances in light of not having a code, having exposed infrastructure and being in a serious hurricane belt. We need to develop a national plan that takes this, strat this analysis into consideration and it will have implications for what, how we go about deal with our existing stock, how we build new housing stock and how we implement minimum standards for doing so. We need to put an implementation plan in place. The Prime Minister mentioned, for example, over the next 10 years, reaching a certain level. This needs to be clearly documented with clear guideposts put in place so by next year, this is what we need to achieve, the year after that, the year after that, and by 2030, this is where we need to be. That needs to be known and followed and made to happen. And last of all, let me say that whatever we do, world-class quality must be the underlying philosophical foundation. The only other option that I can see and that we can see at BAP is that we spend a lot more time in serious prayer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. Your views and, the, and those of the PM are not at odds now, I can see that clearly. She did preface you with, with tasking the Attorney General's office of having our resolution to the Building Standards Code by June next year. So that would take care of the concerns that you express in the meetings leading up to this. All right, ladies and gentlemen, as we move on in the program, um, the next session we're going to get perspectives from the Rural Development Commission and the Housing Planning Unit, the Ministry of Housing, Lands and Rural Development Unit in um, the voices of Mr. Russell Armstrong and Mr. Andre King. Just invite you to welcome them to the stage, please.
Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Russell Armstrong, representing the Rural Development Commission. Well, I'm a civil engineer um, at heart, uh, and, and, and as such, um, I, I, I bear with the comments just, just made. But I also need to say that, it, to put it in perspective again, we have people in this room who have been tasked with going to, to, to Grenada, Dominica, Bahamas, Antigua and Barbuda to help them in their recovery process. This is the kind of brains that we have in the room today. You know, we have people that have training colleges in Barbados with standards that are internationally recognized. And, and, and I am just saying this because, to give a little story, I was in the pediatrician's office one time with my daughter and, and she got a call. And the person on the phone was yelling at her, her, her little toddler had a half a millipede in her hand. And she wanted to know what are the, what are the, what's the problem? And she was, she was so anxious. But the pediatrician wanted to know where's the other half of the millipede. So the point I'm making is, is that what we think sometimes is the critical matter is what we already know is what we do not know that's the critical matter. And is in this regard that I think that this kind of forum is long overdue. UDC has asked for it, RDC welcomes it, and I hope that as we go forward, we can be mature about it and there's no offense, but we see it as a process of moving forward together. Now from the perspective of, of, of the Rural Development Commission and government, you know, we, we see a lot of um, we see a lot of cases out there that are quite dire, things that we really don't come across every day in Barbados. And if we don't dig a little deeper, we don't even know they exist. And what I'm hoping to see as we move forward is some legislative um, alterations. We hear we hear the, the comments that. You know, somebody can't build a, 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 a wall because they're on somebody's rented land. But you know, I, I, I heard, I heard the prime minister say, right? But you got bulldozers and so forth in this day and age. So what, what, what is the problem with, what is the problem with building a wall structure on a piece of land that can be so easily moved? You know, holding people to, because we got to study, are we holding people to a, a quality of life? and a standard of life that we think that they deserve. And I think that that's what we ended up doing. If a person can afford to build a wall structure, I think the framework should be there for that person to, to, to be allowed to do so. I personally hope that as we move forward, the Rural Development Commission, um, and, and in some cases the urban, I'm speaking out of turn, they haven't tasked me with doing that, but knowing their struggles as well, that we could see more concrete structures built because I am, I am of the opinion also that if we are to build these wooden homes to the standard that we have to build them to, 16 inch stud spacings and all these kind of things, you know, we can have the conversation on it as we said, but it is known the cost gets up there. And where are we building something at the same cost that is less resilient than another? As, as I said, is it classes? Is it legislation? We, we have to ask these questions, but I will hope as we move forward that my clients are not held to any classes or less than quality standards that we can see ourselves moving forward. We ain't putting the carpenters out of work because everyone need a roof. Everybody need cupboards and doors and so forth. So that will handle itself. But I am hoping personally that we can set some measurable, achievable targets. What is that as government we say, in the next three years, we want to see 70% of the structures in Barbados out of concrete. It's measurable and it's achievable. Whether we say that, you know, we give, the, we, we expect $100 million in damage, so therefore we need to, to offer at least $20 million in concessions where it comes to concrete blocks, cement, these kind of things, to allow it to become more achievable and, and, and affordable, which I think at the end of the day costs is at the root basis of all of this discussion. It is cost. So, you know, these are some of the things that I just want to throw out. 
I also want to touch on the, the insurance aspect because, you know, as Rural Development Commission, you put somebody in a home, but you know that person cannot realistically afford to insure that home for eleven, twelve hundred dollars a year. Do, do we carry the burden and, and insure these houses? Because at the end of the day, is the insurance that is going to bail us out if we have any significant impact in the near future. The insurance is, you know, that's what's going to cover us in terms of the funds to rebuild. So, questions again. The other half in the Melopita, I don't know. Um, I think as a government, we pay our workers to be managers. Wherever you are, you are a manager of what you are doing. If there's a manager over you, so be it. But if government is providing management, I think we need to invest in the training of our government workers. The supervisory management, and I'm not talking about doing a supervisory management course in terms of how to deal with people. Government does that very well. I'm talking about quality standards, as was just um, highlighted. You, you need to have supervisors on the ground who are uh, adequately trained in terms of the standards that are required to maintain those standards. I remember going once on a job way back when, when nobody in here was supervisor over where I was, and, 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 and a house was being built, and I asked a, a particular contractor to enforce a standard. He asked me if I think he built in a hotel, he gonna make a call. Well, he built the hotel at the end of the day, because if I am going to be uh, accountable for government funds, I got to hold them to the standards that's expected of me. And this is what we need to, we cannot have supervisors out there saying, I know this used to do for this how long, and this how I can do it. We cannot have that. So I think as government, we need to, and I'm not talking about somebody with a degree in a particular discipline. I'm talking about persons who are trained. As I say, we got things like Walbrent and different colleges. I think government can do some investment on their own, but we need to invest in, 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 our, in our supervisory management um, where it comes to quality. And I cannot forget my contractors who faithfully come out and do their best according to what they know to help the clients that we give them. These are men who, if you look at, if I got a list of 50 contractors, they got at least four workers, a minimum of four. That is 200 households that I am affecting in Barbados. And those households are not the upper income. Those are the low income households, my contractors. And these gentlemen cannot afford, in some cases, to be able to put food on the table and support themselves, pay bills, pay men, maintain standards, and then also keep themselves up to date sometimes because nothing is free. So we need to provide training programs outside of vocational training board, outside of these areas that these gentlemen can benefit from these kind of experiences. Sometimes, you know, to see is to know. You know, I welcome the details, but again, we need to move fast just was here and, and broaden the spectrum a little bit. So I don't want to touch on too much of what was said before. I just wanted to, you know, enlighten you to what you might already know. We have the resources in this country to adequately address the problems. But let us fully explore and ventilate what the problems are I hope I have briefly done it from my perspective as RDC, and hopefully we can get some meaningful input um, as the session goes on. Thank you very much. Madam Prime Minister, members of the cabinet, fellow colleagues and building professionals alike, ladies and gentlemen. 
The name is Andre King. I am standing here as a representative of the Housing Planning Unit in the Ministry of Housing. I'll just be giving you a very short presentation on what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is in the context of relocation projects. Um, to just give you an idea of who we are and what we've done, anytime you walk in front of the central bank and you see that lovely green scape that has gone up there in recent times, that is the HPO. Kensington relocation, that development that took place, HPU again. And the airport expansion project, HPU. And I probably could stand here the whole morning and tell you about what the HPU has done, but I won't do that. We're just going to go into um, the presentation. And um, like I said, it should be brief. And after that, you can have more. Okay, I'm going to get some help. That's always good. <clears throat> All right, this is basically where it starts, ground break. And this is trenching for typical strip foundation. Most of you in here would know what a strip foundation is. And um, it's just a, probably might not be able to make it out, but that is basically the, the line. And the, in the very, very far corner, there's a, what we call a profile, basically to lay out traditional way and give you some accuracy so that when you cut your trenches that you are, your building is not larger than what it should be and that the measurements um, add up. Next slide. Um, this is the trench, but at a later stage, the white stuff you can see on the bottom is blinding. You can use a weak concrete, or in this case, that is marl fill. And the longitudinal lines you see running through there are your reinforcement bars, typically T12 with uh, a stirrup made from the same T12 rebar. And you can see a better, a better reference for the, the profile um, for, the, for the corners of the building. And oh, there's some shuttering in there, obviously, to, to keep the concrete as, as clear as possible. Next slide. OK. This is the foundation block wall, typical construction again. What you probably would not see here would be the brick force, but that is, as you would know, applied every three courses. and um, Grouting at that same three crosses as well and uh, continue until it meets uh, capping reinforcement, which is the, the plywood that you can see there. That is the preparatory work for side capping beam. That basically helps the foundation to work as a unified whole. Next slide. Uh, this is um, an inside look. You can see the, the beam cage. And um, if you look closely enough, there is a, there's a cross member that is a provision for anchorage. Now, typically with a timber house, in order to make sure that timber house holds to the ministry foundation, you use anchorage um, in the form of what we call jail bolts. Um, typically, the spacing for those will be like around 36 inch centers. Um, and you basically place those in prior to the, to the pour, obviously, and once they're basically poured in, in, in place, the, the house, the soil plates of the house are fastened down to the, the concrete capping beam. Next slide. Um, I don't know if you can make the, the picture out, but this is basically a partial pour. You can see some reinforcement peeping up out of the capping beam. That particular section of the foundation you are seeing is the, the bathroom. The ba every, part, every other part of the house apart from the bathroom would be timber typically and plisem sheets. Um, what happens here then is that you would put your farm work in and the slab then would be poured on, on top of that. Next slide. That is the prep work there, the grid, uh, first bottom, second bottom, reinforcement. And if you look in the far, that would be the right corner. You can see the stirrups peeping up, um, similar, similar setup. And then there are also some, some bars, some vertical reinforcement coming up for the block walls for the bathroom. Next slide. That is the finished casting of the capping beam. And you can see if you, I don't know how well you can see it, but there is one of the, the anchorage, the anchorage bolts cast into the concrete. Next slide. This is the better picture. You can see the, the, uh, the sole plate. And it, that looks like Purple Heart to me as well, too. Bolted down to the foundation. And that 
looks like a first joist that is in place. Next slide. This is the, well, two things. The, the house framed up both walls and roof, and we've seen the, um, the placing, um, the starting of it at least to be applied um, to the structure. Next slide. This is the roof. Um, you can see there are about two rafters in this picture that is um, cladded with T111 and the rafters are fastened on either side to a head plate or a top plate with um, hurricane straps. Next slide. This, um, as we're moving a, a bit further ahead, windows are in. A, a lot is happening here in this picture. Windows are in. You already see your priming coat on because uh, they're getting ready to apply finishes and, and, and so forth. In this case, the finish would be paint to the walls and then a trowel on finish, be it trowel plastic or the other product from Berger or other such um, company to the, to, the, to the wall section. Next slide. This particular, yeah, this particular one here shows uh, the process a bit further along. Uh, this house, coincidentally, is actually part of the ongoing farmer's relocation. It was built um, as a collaborative effort between the housing planning unit and the National Housing Corporation. And the way our model works, sometimes we will work with private contractors, sometimes the contractor will actually be NHC, but regardless of whether it is NHC or the um, private contractor, we hold both to the to the same standard and as my colleague would have mentioned earlier, the whole question of accountability when you're in a job like this, the question is normally asked, if anything goes wrong, well, what happened out there and where and what, and you often have to give an explanation. And like him, I'm in agreement that training for both the technical staff as in the ones who will be the eyes and ears and representative of the various government agencies and places like rural and the Urban Development Commission, among others, would be able to be in a position to give the government value for money when it comes to the supervision and construction of these units, and add to that the fact, too, that materials aren't remaining stagnant. Things are changing all the time. This house, looking at it, most people believe, well, it's your typical ship blackboarding on a house, but this is actually the, uh, the title says there's a place time structure. And I'm also told, too, that you can have these claddings in PVC. So what we need to be doing, we are constantly chasing, and hopefully we will catch up at some point in time. As far as breaking technologies are concerned, I believe that government should be leading the way in terms of us being aware and up to par with the new materials that are in the market so that we can blaze the path in terms of chasing this whole dream of affordable housing, and truly affordable housing, but affordable housing that is also safe. Next slide. And this is near finished product because you can see the bags in the front. There's no site cleanup as yet, but typically once that has been done, that is typically the end of it. I don't think I exceeded my 10, right, Mark? I'm good. Right, so um, the Q&A that will follow, if there are any questions, this was merely what we do. We're not suggesting that it's perfection. It is a constant work. It is a work in progress. Actually, I am currently investigating the whole possibility of using a metal stud in place of possibly what we do now in terms of timber framing as a possible solution, provided that it is cost effective and that, I guess, could be made possible if concessions and so forth are arranged in the right direction that those materials will not be seen as something that are far to reach, but quite attainable. So, like, like I said, it is, it is a work in progress, and um, we're hopeful that at the end of it all, what can happen is that with your feedback, with your interaction, we can perfect or make what is now being done better. I thank you. Good job, Andrea. Thank you for that presentation. I remember when it was a child, my grandmother, we from Lightfoot Lane. Most of you wouldn't know where that is, but we had a small, small house, 15 people in it. And then I remember my uncle left, my, my great uncle left, and then there was this wall thing in front of the house, a wall at the back, and you had to step over the wall to get in the house. And then it got bigger and they started with the bathroom, and it was like that for maybe 12 years before they finished, actually finished with a bathroom 
wall structure bathroom and a wooden, the rest of it. So, you know, when you see houses like that, that is a one-time thing, as a one-time investment, and they don't know if that can satisfy the low income. So this is why we're here today. We're here to discuss, and the Prime Minister said last week, moral leadership. Moral leadership is knowing that if we have to meet a demand for the lower income, the price of it must be such that they can afford it. So that's where we're putting our heads today in terms of the designs and in terms of our creation of this request for proposals, which leads us into the next session. And we have to apologize because we're not going to have this presentation on how to make resilience affordable, but we're going to kind of coach that into the last two sessions with the afforded, affordable housing project, the request for proposals, and that will be done by Mr. Raymond Lord. Um, and he is from the National Housing Corporation. Please give him a warm welcome to the head table, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, Prime Minister, members of Cabinet, fellow colleagues. I didn't necessarily want to speak from here. The last time I was out of podium, was preaching. I don't do that anymore. Which is a, either could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. Um, just want to tie off a few, few things. This is for the affordable housing project designed as the RFP, proposed for the RFP. Um, what we're really looking at here in Barbados is the provision of shelter. I like to tell people national housing gives people shelter, and they, they say they buy a house, but it's really shelter, and they make it into a home. The, 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 the home is the community aspect, the life, the living. Our job is to make sure people are not living in the rough, sleeping in the rough, or out in the streets, to reduce homelessness, to reduce um, overcrowding and those kinds of things. So the key concept that we're looking here, one key concept for us and natural housing is cost. Cost is a very important factor in housing. We cannot get away from it. And what the discussion we're having in our own organization is that we are really, I'm going to say it in public, hedging bets. And our design portfolio is a, what it is that we will, can adequately design for that will allow people to be safe and what is the time if you had a negative event, that they could return and spring back to it on their own quickly. So some of the ideas we've been having, looking at safe rooms and housing, changing roofs and things like that. This presentation, though, will have no pictures. No pictures because it is putting the RFP forward and we want you to begin to think of what it is that you need to do. And without telling you or taking you down the line or guiding you. So it has no pictures. You saw all the pictures, what we did before. It is for you now to think, to move forward. Next slide. Okay, it's, it's, it's just a bit of background. The government is committed to ensuring that all Barbians have access to safe, don't go too fast, it's, it's animated, comfort and healthy shelter, shelter in an environment that allows the realization of their full human potential. Given the intensity of other events, we must change how we design. We must begin to mitigate against storms and not only storms, the geological events that are supposed to occur as well. We therefore are seeking to mainstream climate and weather resilience into the affordable or housing slash shelter design. And sometimes you see me say social housing. I use them interchangeably. My friends in the housing planning unit tell me I shouldn't, but I think social housing and affordable housing should, should mesh at some point. Forward. Slide. Can you click the slide? Purpose. So we've been mandated to secure designs for resilient houses for its affordable or social housing program. That's what we have to do. It's rightly so because natural housing is a major provider of social housing in Barbados, and as government, we must take the lead. So we've banded into low income and middle income houses. And we would like to see at least three designs in each band. Go forward. We are particularly interested in designs that do a number of things. One, 
utilize a modern interpretation of the Barbian archite architecture vernacular. However you interpret that to be, you, de you design it, you interpret it, you, but there's a particular vernacular and it comes out of a particular experience with living in this country that we want to see. Utilize modern building technologies and materials that have proven or rated resilience against at least a category storm event. Um, some parents say you should go to category four. We can have a discussion on that, but my idea is again, we are in social housing from government, we are hedging bets and hedging costs. And it may be that you, it could be that you, part of the building can be designed to category four. We are working at national housing with what is called the safe room concept now where one building, one section of the building is actually a concrete bunker, and the rest of the building utilizes other materials. I don't want to put too much out there, but that kind of far thing we're looking at. Also, you please consider geologic hazards. Again, it came up in the form of your foundations, as Mr. Pander talked about. The geologic hazards are also important, and also the substrate that you're looking at. We need to have people look at foundations a bit more carefully. This is important for us. Have the propensity to be easily expanded and improved in keeping the Barbarian tradition of incremental building. Barbarians will find a square foot to add something. And one of the things I'm very happy of from when we went to work in our in that all of our designs so far have, have had that propensity. You can increase them from the starter home to the more finished ones. People find a way to add because we give them enough time to do so. So please don't think of anything that is conceptually finish alone. Barbadians, as their families expand, they want a TV room, they want a garage, they want something else, they want to add to the building. That's part of our culture, because as the economic and their financial, they will add and invest in their homes. So you don't want anything that's totally stoic. Um, this is not law, but come on, comply with the Barbarous Building Code or appropriate best practice guideline. If the building code comes on stream, you, you confirm, you comply with that. Or Come on, we, we know what works and what doesn't work and what is, what is good design and what is possibly bad design. And what is good engineering and what is bad engineering. No one should have to tell someone, put a boat, do this. Maybe you do, but try to comply as best to that. Allow for the incorporation of principles of energy conservation, reuse, and generation as part of the design. One of the problems I tease my architect, my architect friends with in Barbados is that I think they borrow temperate country housing designs and drop them in Barbados. These are buildings that are being designed for heating, to be warm. So then you complain the house is hot. Maybe you have to look at it and maybe the buildings are hot. Then you have to escalate costs by having cooling, artificial cooling. Can we look at these things in order to come up with a design that is functional? Also, we have to have energy generation, make sure the roofs, for example, can support solar panels. Can the roofs not support additional things? Or can we go to a broad design to community energy generation? And if the building can tie into a community grid, simple approaches to that. Green building technology, again, these are important things that we must look at. Um, Mr. Pader made a point. Can we not begin to have a discussion about how can we save costs on imports of building materials? What can we look at locally? What can we recycle? We're not saying that you're going to create Sanford and Sun, but you are going to look at what is there. What is on island that you can repurpose? What can be used effectively? One of the problems with housing, and we need to have a discussion about this, housing is a large user of foreign exchange. And where you can begin to have a discussion about taking that process the other way, we, we can move towards financial and economic resilience as well. Go back. I missed, I've not done the bottom yet. Um, adhere to compliance and relevant guidelines from the Chief Town Planner and the Director of the Environmental Protection Department, especially EPD, with respect to um, room sizes and ventilation which are key. Those are very important um, aspects of the thinking for the RFP so far. Go ahead. Um, the scope of service, so far we've designed it. Um, band one, a low income house designs. It's 475 square feet to 675 square feet. 
We're aiming for a, con a unit construction cost of not more than 175 square dollars per square foot. Um, fully outfitted bathroom with a rudimentary kitchen only. Floor finishings with polished concrete. Um, submission on, in these bands are restricted to personal arrest drafts from architectural technicians. Um, we, well, I'm sorry. We, we are looking at it in two ways. To, because, firstly, people in the lower income bracket will tend to use a draftsman. That's a fact. Um, lower income, even up to upper middle income, we tend to use a draftsman. And we don't want to make the, the project exclusionary to any one group because there are some architects that do some very good work. And you also want to bring along them in the training process that they understand where the improvements are to come. Good. Next one. So we recommend for band two, this is for the middle income. 696 square feet to 1490 square feet. The reason I stopped at 1490 is that, that excludes the building on the town planning regulations of a water tank. And my former chief is smiling at me. He knows my position for years on the water tank situation. Um, so therefore, it's at 1490. The cost is 225, which my colleagues tell me is the market cost per square foot. And we're hoping that some persons can tell me that it's too high. Mr. Lord, I yes. gotta stop you now because mm -hmm. I want you to go back to band one. Yeah, uh, uh, and there's a fundamental discussion that we need to have as a mm -hmm. people. Four hundred and seventy-five square feet. Four hundred and seventy-five square feet. Mm -hmm. What are we really doing and saying? Talk to me. The four sign five. I have, I have a serious I know you do, man. difficulty. Mm -hmm. and I would not be associating myself mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. And that is why I'm going to intervene and I want to make myself clear. Mm -hmm. Government will intervene in the market because to build at $175 for poor people in this country is to rip and rip off poor people. Mm -hmm. And I am not going to be in that. Secondly, the development costs, and I keep making the point that when this economy turned down in 2008, I know what it was to be a minister of education, and the companies that went into the construction of schools never even looked at anything called a government contract before and that we then had to sustain their prices, their rates of return, their dividends, their board fees, yeah, in a way that we did not have to sustain before 2008. And the cost of construction to government exploded out of the roofs. Similarly, the cost of development of land exploded because all of a sudden we were trying to sustain rates of return that were hitherto being sustained by the west coast of Barbados. We have to come back down to earth. Mm -hmm. And we will not be able to have a massive expansion in housing if the prices that we are putting are outside of the reach of ordinary people. Now there are two things that I feel strongly about in terms of the minimum standards. Mm -hmm. One is that the house has to be habitable. And is 475 square feet habitable for a family? Or is that purely a studio for a single person? Secondly, mm -hmm. can we in this day and age admit of anybody having housing without water and without waterborne facilities? And if we cannot, then we need to change and to accept that as a matter of law, we have to protect people's right to water mm -hmm. in this day and age and to waterborne facilities. Now, that has to be the new minimum in the same way that nobody will contemplate a child reaching 
16 or 17 without having gone to primary and secondary school in this day and age and pre-primary. That there has to be a given. And I'd like, these are the things that I'd like this consultation to speak to. And I'd like to hear a lot more from the people who are here as well, although the structure of it does not admit easily of it. So I'll let you continue, yeah. but I'm telling you that, yeah, we've had that that these things here, you all can have the discussion. Mm -hmm. I don't know where the Minister of Finance is going to find any money for you to support this program. So, but I'm free to you continuing at 475. <laughs> let me just go about that. What things we have piloted um, with the first time does it starts in what we call our starter home band. And that allows for incremental increase. And we do have a number of persons who come and, and take those houses from us, land space. But no, but hold on, man. Hold on, Prime Minister. Then we also have some larger ones. One of the things you did mention, man, that's important to, these, to the costing relates to the infrastructure thing. And once that, and when we have that discussion, once that intervention does arise, we can turn the figures back. However, but, but it's one, not only that, mm -hmm. Raymond, let's get real. Mm -hmm. We have gotten accustomed to just putting numbers on paper without breaking it down and making this thing work for poor people in this country. I'm begging us now. I'm begging us. Let us break it out. And that's why I asked you all the question earlier about the cement board. I also asked it because cement is actually more foreign exchange friendly than, than timber. timber. Because all of the constituent elements for the manufacturing of cement with the exception of the fuel are on that. and well the sand but the sand is only recently a problem and even that we can do a deal with one or two other countries that are very close to us and that can minimize the amount of hard currency in other words u.s dollars that we have to use so i want to hear those are the things that i want to hear coming out of this meeting because if we don't lay claim to what kind of barbados we want and as we say i'm not contractor. I'm not an engineer. If you're going to get into those details, I can leave the room. But what I need you to do at this stage, first and foremost, is for us to agree as to what are some of the basic minimum standards, either in terms of cost, in terms of space, in terms of building standards, in terms of my role is really to get you all to come out of the temple of your familiar and to start to think differently rather than to assume that well, we were doing it this way for years and we can continue to do it this way. Now, I know you can come out of the comfort of your familiar. So I want us to do so. But equally, if you do it at 475, every time I pass those houses in Boarded Hall, I want to choke. <laughs> no, I do. Because I think that it is the greatest disservice and, and town planning under me ain't going to do it either. And you know my position. It is the greatest disservice we are doing to our people. And then the Attorney General can have sleepless nights when done because you have used people and herded people and put them like if they're in the middle passage again. Now we have to create a new norm in this country. Now I don't mind if you tell me that you're doing duplexes. I also maintain that low income housing and elevators, either we have to find a way once you're doing elevators with low-income housing, you're condemning people to almost dysfunctional environments because once the elevator stops working, what happens? I'm invariably with little children running about and playing with the elevator, and what, what happens? So that in our context, that's not going to, a Valerie-type housing is not going to work easily again. But we can do a London-born one. <laughs> And most people don't believe that London Born is public housing, even though it doesn't have a lot of space in the context of town. But once we're talking about sites and services and larger properties, I have a difficulty with the 475. We're not fooling you. Yeah. The 475 can be considered, I mean, I do take the point to be small, but it's been done. It has worked in some extent. That's why we got a 675. Now, the square footage, I'm guided by my colleagues, costs. The point is, to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the room is, if you can do this, if you can do this better, cheaper, as it says, not to exceed, if you can produce 700 
at a particular cost and this band, it's not said we're going to throw it out because it meets other criteria, energy design and things, things like that. But we want parents to think about this. I, I do take the point that for sacrifice starting may be, may, be, may be a challenge, but as I said before... What we're doing is giving profit to the professionals and contractor at the expense of the poorest person in the society. And that's what it is. I mean, let, let's be real. When in truth and in fact, mm -hmm. I'm saying to you that if you have the amount of construction that's going to mm -hmm. start taking place in this country in the next few months, a lot of the people that are knocking about housing and education mm -hmm. ain't going to be about housing and education no more. They're going back at the top end of the market. That's true. That's the ball reality. So that we have to be able to make sure that we don't price the ones at the bottom out of the market. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the people you're pricing it for go along with the business and gain after the business at the top end of the market. And that's, that is managing what we have inherited for the last decade. That's what the economic implosion of the last decade has led us to. And we've transferred all of that weight for our construction sector to make money on the backs of the people who have to continue building but who don't have the option to say, I'm building a hotel because things ain't working for me now. We still have to build schools. We still have to build low-income housing. So everybody's trying to make back the money off of that platform. It can't carry the weight. It cannot carry the weight. For Mr. Hill, but the challenge is to the room. Get your construction costs down. You can send us back some feedback what you think the cost structure should be. And we will listen for low-income housing should be, should be, should be. We have, we have our own ideas, in our, but given what I've been told, I, I take the point, it's, see, it could be quite high, but it could be accurate. Um, just go for it. Go over serve middle-income house designs. The size is there, and that may again may be high, but it says not to exceed. So we are looking for people to come up with cost-effective mechanisms to bring the, the structure down, the cost down. And this submission is, at this point, remember this is just the draft, is restricted to persons who are registered as architects. For it. Um, further information is submission of proposals, evaluated on awards, will be forthcoming. And go back. Feedback, both positive and negative, you'd like to hear. Yes. Good afternoon. I represent a company out of Houston, Texas, um, Three Space, and we build Hurricane Three and Four houses. And what I'm hearing here is a lot of concrete and a lot of wood. We use what's called eco silicate, which is a bio uh, material that is rated that high. And we build our houses from that. And it's 50% less. 50% less time to make and to build. And here, to bring it here, one of the binding um, materials that we use is a, is a fibrous material. Before I got on the plane to get here, I talked to our engineer, our chemist, and told them to go and look at using sugarcane to use for that material. And it's a very good possibility that it will keep that same standard. So that material to build here would bring in, would keep us here. We wouldn't have to bring in other things. And we're talking about building according to different aspects and stuff like that. We don't have that problem. We just make whatever plans we want to make and we fill it. And then we remove the molding and that's what it is. And it's that rated. It's rated three and four. It's insect proof because biosilicate is insect proof and it's flood proof so that is something that of course i will be presenting you know that to to your company but that is a way getting outside of the concrete and the and the wood and everything that we're normal normally using going into what's being produced today to moving forward thank you when the rfp goes live hopefully by the end of the week, early next week, you're free to submit your proposals. But we are looking, as they said, the RFP for new ideas, new technologies, and things like that. 
Uh, morning, everybody, again. Um, coming off of that point, just two quick things. Raymond, in terms of the, um, I heard just some, some mumbling in terms of what, what constitutes um, low income in terms of people understanding for themselves. So I don't know if we want to put a dollar figure, instead of a per square foot price, a dollar figure say $80,000 or $60,000 and let people work within that realm. However, because as you know, I know, significant study would have been gone, gone into our clients and what they can afford and affordability. And I think one of the problems with the 475 is if you're working at a particular square footage cost, and you're just dividing it, that's how you get the 475. But if people can reduce that 175 and so forth, obviously then the, the, the envelope gets bigger. So I think in terms of a dollar amount too, to help people to understand, but that, that is, you gotta look at it and how you can evaluate. Now the next quick point pertaining to what was just said, I didn't get to say earlier, but I think it, it could be a cost. But I think, again, we have enough brilliant minds in Barbados that we ought to look into a testing facility in the country or in the Caribbean. We work in as CARICOM now because I agree with what you say. Yeah, it's nice and material, whatever, but we could test it. We could test it. We could put it up. And we, could, we, could, we, could, we could shoot the, um, the, 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 the projectiles at it. We could put it under wind pressure, whatever. But I think the Caribbean is so vulnerable that we indeed need to look at a testing facility, windows, doors, walls, new building materials, because at the end of the day, engineering is science, and it's based on what was tested and what was done. So, you know, we need to, 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 to possibly look into like a testing facility locally, that we don't need to take figures sent to us, and we can actually do the analysis ourselves. I, um, sorry, just a quick question. Um, does this include um, the input VATs? Your rates, your proposed rates, does this include for input VAT or no VAT? My name is Nigel Reese from Spring Homes Limited. At our rates, we, we assume VAT is in. National Housing pays, pays VAT, so we all assume that VAT is present. I, I wouldn't make an assumption that there's no VAT. That is always present when we do our business. Um, morning. <laughs> yeah, 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 I just want to make a quick contribution. Um, addressing um, house construction in Barbados at this time, I think Nigel Jones from Ministry of Environment, right? Um, it must start with some honesty, and I want to speak. Um, in the forestry context. Um, wood density is an indicator of the wood strength, which is measured by a specific gravity comparing to water. And the forest community, for some time now, have been growing a lot of high density forest cover, meaning that the trees must compete um, basically for light, forming their different stratification, their stories, and so on. And as a result, you get um, a compromise. Um, the was strength being compromised because you have um, incomplete rings forming. You have um, incomplete telecystices where you have your um, the parenchyma cells not forming well. And also you have things like incomplete um, lignification. Now, you have this in itself now reduces the wood strength, but that is compounded further by the section of the woods. And I think the engineer should hear this. Woods would have three surfaces. Wood have, has three surfaces. You have the transverse, the tangential, and also you have the radial surface, which is the strongest of the surfaces. Um, so, so. Usually when you're talking about construction material, you should have radial wood. But I can see, as I look around, a lot of tangential wood is being used. And wood comprises of a lot of knots, which is a signature of a branch, meaning that wood is very weak, but it has branches in it. And this is something you must look at. Um, a third problem here, too, 
is the seasonal component. I mean drying of the wood. Um, there are two ways of drying wood. You have um, air drain and you have oven drain. And when you, to get, to get wood quick on the market, there's a lot of oven drain where the free water is easily removed and then you have also the bung water, which is the water in the wood cell, um, remo being removed at a fast rate. So what happens is that this wood cell collapses, collapses. And when you sell that wood, it may look strong, but quickly you, you realize that after you can use, use it for construction, you find it having cups, bows, twisting, a lot of um, deform, um, deformity. Also too, because of the rapid extraction of water, for commercial purposes, there's a lot of checking, which is the longitudinal spin of the wood fibers. And all of these engineers should be taken into account before the thing about construction of, um, of properties. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, um, Nigel Reese from Spring Homes Limited. Um, it, with regards to affordable income, it surprised me just now um, that we are being presented with we've been doing affordable income housing in Barbados for many years. Um, and my question is, is why are we sort of constantly trying to come up with maybe different models all the time where we've, we've dealt with affordable income. We, there are many companies in Barbados who have done models, standard models, and you'll see them all over Barbados. And they don't change much. The size has changed slightly. The amount of rooms maintain the same thing. There's minimum requirements of the sizes of rooms of houses. Um, my main question is, is Maybe we need to look at, first of all, just to get things started, look at putting together a um, set amount of uh, models that we know work. We have some in Barbados right now that work. Um, and creating a bill of materials. Uh, there, there's design softwares out there where you can, you can design a model and have every piece of material itemized and let people tender <clears throat> based on the quantities and your tenders are going to be similar across the board once the quantities maintain that brings us back to make, maintaining a certain standard of building um, and to me that is that is a, a good starting place rather than just saying look this is this is square foot price find a way to build it at that square foot price. Uh, because contractors are smart people and we could present what we need people to see. And when it's time to build the house and certain things happen, such as a, a massive cost in any development um, is the foundation cost. Depend on how deep you have to go, the type of foundation you want to build. Um, for instance, there was that, that green house that was very, very tall and it had a strip foot in around the house and there was a lot of money wasted in that picture uh, based on the type of foundation that should, could have been used to minimize costs on that type of land because it was a slope land. Um, but my point is, is that we need, to, we need to standardize what we want to do for affordable income housing. And we need to start small and then start to expand. Um, and I think we need, to, we need to look at a certain set of models um, which the private sector can uh, propose. NHC, NHC obviously has their standard models too. And build an accurate build of, bill of materials for such models so that we, we're, all, all contractors are moving on a level playing field. Um, because we, we could use all different materials, but you're not comparing apples to apples uh, if, you're, if you're doing different scenarios. That doesn't mean not trying to explore alternatives. Um, and my last point is um, what uh, 
the Prime Minister spoke about with uh, collection of water in Barbados. And I've heard on many of the talk shows um, about the legality of using rainwater as potable water. Um, that, that wheel is being built already. Bermuda has very, very few water mains to housing. And they use rainwater as potable water. I have a friend that lives in Bermuda who can attest to that. And we need to take examples that are proven already rather than spend money in trying to come up with new ideas. There, there are a lot of different things out there that work. And I would advise looking into Bermuda's model. It works. It's proven and they survive. And I would suggest on the water side of things that we look into their model of um, collecting water and using it as possible. Thanks. Uh, Mark, just if I could reply that quickly. Um, that's why we're here, because in Barbados, we do, do housing delivery fairly well. I mean, we, we do the small the private contractors do deliver houses at different sites. The RFP and what we're discussing is resilience of what we have done. Are we sure that the roof pitches at 20 degrees that we build in 22 degrees and 25 degrees in a Category 2 event will not roll off and go down the sea? So we're beginning now to open discussion about social affordable housing as to how to make it better, make it stronger. So it's not just that we, we have a model that works. We may have models that we are able to roll out. But are those models fit for purpose for the next 20 years? Are the houses that we put down now with the roofs, what will happen to the roofs? So those are the kinds of discussions that the RFP and what we're doing here. The, the issue here is resilience. Uh, is resilience. It's not only housing delivery. You can put down 200 houses out of a housing machine. You can, have a, you can pour them. You can spray them. You can do whatever. Are they in a hurricane event going to stand up? What other modifications can we do to the house to ensure people will be safe? So those are the kinds of discussions that when you go back to your offices that you, you begin to have. Are the roof pitches that you're using the best thing for hurricane resilience? Even if you screw them down with 12 foot bolts. What that is the discussion where we're going. And I must say this, to have it cost effective and reasonable. There is a difference between market housing that mostly contracts build and social and affordable housing that we do. I don't want to go into the pocket cost because, as the Prime Minister said, some of the changes in the economic system have skewed it. I have a, a particular opinion on that, which I won't put out here yet. But we need to address that. But we have to come at housing and shelter that's effective, resilient for people that people can afford. Remember at National Housing, I am charged with providing a maid with shelter. She's not going to be getting a large sum of money by week or by the month. I also have provided a postman. I also have provided a policeman. A, a teacher will come to us as well. So we have a, a long band of people to address. Again, those must be. So the issue is also resilience that you can look at. Yes, uh, Granville Phillips, uh, Walbrent College. Uh, there's a few things. Uh, I, first of all, I endorse the, the testing uh, lab. Uh, Barbados National Standards Institute, um, they could sort of do that. Just pull this out. Right. Um, secondly, why have you disqualified engineers from um, tendering as well? I see there's something there for the drafts persons, and then the band two, that's for the architects. Um, can engineers not also tender on these things? I guess our professional can wait and have our professional classes submit as well. Yes. That's fine. All right. Um, because you have the draftsmen doing the band one, but the houses in band one must still um, withstand the category three hurricane. So how are they to certify that? They're not engineers. Um, so I would suggest that you allow all persons to tender, and then you choose the best. Um, I'm happy to see the Attorney General here. I understand then that <clears throat> legislation is going to be put in place for the building code, but there is no useful building code for houses in Barbados. 
Um, so we put in the, the, I guess, the cart before the donkey. We need to have the building, some building standards that are useful to homeowners, and then we have the legislation to support that. Um, in terms of costs, again, I built my house for about $100 a square foot. Mm -hmm. um, and it's quality. Um, my wife will not allow me to build anything else. Mm -hmm. So I have the granite countertops, I have the porcelain tiles, and $100 a square foot. Uh, there was a lot of steel in it, but no steel, right? <laughs> there was no steel uh, in it. Um, so it can be done, can be done. right? It can be done. Can't 2007, right? Um, so my suggestion, my strong recommendation actually, is to provide a cost and the standard and challenge us to come up with a design. Um, I, I don't believe that we should be designing anything with thing for no category three hurricane. Uh, not after 2017 when we had hurricanes Maria and Irma. And now we just had Dorian. In 1780, we had the great hurricane in Barbados. That was a category five hurricane. Um, winds of up to 200 miles an hour. Dorian was just a little 185, 185 miles an hour. Uh, it caused about 4,000 deaths in Barbados, it went on to cause 9,000 deaths in Martinique with a 25-foot wave surge, 25 foot. Um, Dorian was what, 23 feet. So I don't think we should be playing around with this thing. Challenge us to design something, just give us a cost. Say you want the house, $50,000, $40,000, whatever, and let us do it, right? We've been educated on the taxpayers' expense. We have the knowledge to do it. Just let us do it. Um, well, the other things may be political, so let me keep quiet. <laughs> Points that I, I welcome those because thus far I thought we were actually for the first time agreeing on some things. So if you want to keep this separation, you can continue with the political. But thus far, you are good, bad, and wicked. Um, there's no problem with men the RFP to do that. I, I really would like the RFP to challenge your bill. So if, if, if the consensus that we take the, 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 the cost per square foot out and set a top limit for the housing or number of top limits, we can do that. that, that that's, if you want to go that way, that's fine. Um, you'll probably stand I, I, out. Think, I think, Raymond, if we put the criteria yeah. for some of the criteria, but what I want to let us govern. Out of this meeting today, if it is not just to be another talk shop, has to come a small group that is going to go and report back to us within two weeks. Because, as I said, we are running out, we're running against time. I am prepared for us to still put out the RFP, mm -hmm. but to do it in broad terms. Yeah. But the reason for this meeting here today is I didn't want an RFP to go out cold mm -hmm. and people not to understand where mm -hmm. our heads are. And I think that you've heard enough where we've set out what are the things that matter to us without necessarily being um, or requiring a mandatory approach. Because at the end of the day, you are the professionals. But you are the professionals who have to help us build to these considerations and to these standards. And I think the first thing we can agree to is that I would feel as though we were being farcical to ask people to build to category three in circumstances where we know that we are liable to both category five and hurricane, um, and, to, and earthquake, sorry. But it means that we may have to agree that to break out the elements of the cost, and if there are costs that are completely unaffordable for the low income part of the population, then as Minister of Finance, I have a duty to see how best I can do what I have to do. Because there's no sense putting people in something that you know is not going to protect them. That would be criminal or heinous on my part. But I need you to, to agree to a few things. So before we leave here today, 
we need a small working group that's going to come back to us and say, look, we've heard Mr. Trotman, we've heard Mr. Lord, we've heard these people, we've heard government, we've heard the consultation. We want to recommend to the two ministries, housing and public works. This is the criteria we believe that government should take into account as uh, output from this national consultation. And we take it from there and move. We've already agreed that we need to bring the development costs down. The notion that land in Barbados, low income land in Barbados is 20 and $25 per square foot. Tell me which policeman earning $2,700 a month can afford to buy land at $25 a square foot and to build in this country. Tell me which one, which teacher at the bottom end, which nurse at the bottom end. And that's why I say that our intervention into housing is strategic, has to be both for the point of view of resilience first and foremost, but also accessibility and affordability. And things have happened in this market that have made low-income housing unaffordable because low-income housing and public construction has had to carry the costs of the whole industry. So um, I don't know the various associations, but I would ask um, P.S. Cummins that as before we wrap up, that we get a show of hands, a committee of no more than seven or nine people. I'm not choosing Mr. Phillips so that there's no politics in it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this has to be the best of Barbados coming together now for us to get what we need. Now, I don't want to lose time, so Mr. Lord, the RFP can still go out, but the RFP says broadly these things, and then this committee will help us with the criteria for assessing the RFPs. Uh, assessing. The second point I wanted to make is that this notion that only the amount of houses and the amount of construction that we have to undertake in the next few years, there is more than enough for everybody. But people have to be proven and people have to be held to standard. The only thing that I'm not going to agree to is bad work. Whether it is bad work from professionals or bad work from contractors. Because, and that's why, as a lawyer, I know of something called a duty to care. A duty of care. So that once you have a duty of care, we're going to ask you to step up to the plate to it. We will manage the bureaucracy. I see the CTO here. I see Mr. Trotman here. I see others here. Town planning. I'm not sure that I see, but there are enough planners in the room. And I certainly am Minister of Planning. So that we will do what we have to do. But there has to be an understanding that everybody has to come up to the requisite standards and just hold their own for the system to work. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Kelly Hunt, Ministry of Housing and Lands. Yes, I should have made the presentation. Um, my point speaks to the issue that the Prime Minister was just raising about affordability, and I'm deliberately turned this way because it's really to persons who are considering this RFP. One of the reasons we make a distinction between social housing and affordable housing is because when we talk about social housing, we have to remember that the, the state has a duty of care to persons who, and there's, there are some persons who will never be able to house themselves, and the government has to take care of those persons. And inherent in that conversation is the notion of subsidy, subsidized housing, because if the person can't afford to do it for themselves, somebody has to step up and fill the shortfall. Affordable housing. In the concept of affordable housing, it is contextual and it is relative. Affordable for whom? What can you afford? So affordable does not equate to low income. You have to consider low in persons who are low income. What can that low income person afford? What is affordable to a middle income person? That's a completely different story. So within this context of the RFPs, and we're talking about low income persons, a lot of the discussion today has uh, veered towards the notion of persons going out there having a, a turnkey solution and being able to afford that turnkey solution. So whether you build that turnkey solution at $50,000, $60,000, $100,000, $100, again, inherent in that notion is that that person is going to be able to afford a mortgage. When we're talking about low-income persons, that is not necessarily going to be the case. In a lot of instances, we need to remember that 
there's a significant portion of the population of Barbados that houses themselves through simply going to a building material supplier, accumulating materials, and that incremental construction that we're talking about, they're, not, they're, they're starting from nothing. That construction is incremental from the get-go. So incremental at the level of we do the foundation, there's a break until they can accumulate more materials and then put on the first room. It is not incremental that the 475 square foot house is built, which is a, effectively like a one room apartment. It's not incremental from that stage that they're actually able to build that from the get go and then add on because they cannot afford a mortgage to even build that 475 square foot house. So I think those are things when we're talking about low income, we need to remember these and to take those things into consideration that when we're talking about incremental construction for, for the significant portions of Barbadians who are not going to be accessing a mortgage to build, you're really talking at the most basic level, how do you design, how do you, how do you make your design in such a way that you can, that that person who's building the foundation, there's another six month break before they can start to build anything else again, how does that person fit into the picture? Because the government can't build houses for every single person in Barbados. Barbadians have managed to successfully house themselves for all of these years, as poor as they are. How do we now ensure that the person who is able to take care of themselves and not have to rely on government is able to build a house that is resilient and take into, take, take into consideration all the things that you've been discussing here this morning. And for me, that is the challenge for you guys as engineers, architects, designers, to build for the average Barbadian and make it affordable to low-income persons. We're not talking about persons that can go to the bank and access a mortgage. There are lots of other Barbadians that need housing that don't fit into that mold. And that has to be taken into consideration as you're doing your designs. Thank you. Yeah, good morning to everyone, or uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Courtney Greenwich, and I'm a small artisan doing work for the rural development sometimes. And I was here listening all the time, and I realized I have a question for Andrea King where he said that at some points they are thinking about doing a, 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 a metal structure building. And when this there, when there, when there, 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 there comes into that terrain, or does do that, what is it because to become of the artisans or the small air contractors that are doing work for urban or rural development? And even as I'm referring to the guy there on the stage, I can't remember his name, Raymond. Um, yes, the housing that you are building for persons at that 475 um, square feet, which is like actually like a layer hut that someone would build outside, right? I know the government cannot build for everybody at this time, but why, why build some things too small then to add on after and then realize what the lady was there saying, it don't make sense. But where do we as small contractors stand when this big work come in? And where do we stand? And that's the question I ask. I, I can't answer the question as where you will stand, but the government doesn't build huts. I take him to that. Don't build huts. Take real estate. Because we have a proven method. I know four standing five people take objection because in the context it's small. But we have used a system in Barbados called Start Homes that has worked. If you go to Husbands, Hainesville, or oh, not Hainesville, sorry, Oxners, all those areas, we start with Start Homes. As a process that has worked, people start out for a time homeowners. Small families buy them and they add incrementally to them. And it fixes, importantly, it fixes with what our culture of building. So we know that there's a segment of the population that can take it. Should that house not go prior to 600, I'm for that. But that has to come into some other considerations with costs, with infrastructural development, and things like that. We have to manage the Prime Minister said. But we know that our starter homes project can bring, I didn't want to bring any of those pictures because I didn't want to prejudge the thing. I have lots of pictures at National Housing, a study I did the starter homes that are huge now, all in husbands and that is huge. We actually have some sites that have some 
old ones still existing and the big ones aren't. You can go to Cambridge Glade and you'll see a four stand in five there that person bought and within the last two years they have considerably extended it. So we know that this model works to some extent. Should we not go to larger shelter structures? Quite possibly. Again, there's a cost in there. If we get the infrastructure cost down, the materials cost down, if we get good numbers, we can do it. A start a home probably in my mind should really be about 575 to 600. Maybe it should be like 675. Who knows? But we know that the product according to people who take it, how it turns out, you can go to Lancaster phase one and phase two. You'll see some, the whole range there, and you'll see them extend. You can go to Fortescue, not Fortescue, sorry, Woodburn, St. Philip, for you see again, smaller houses, people have taken and extended. We know, because one of the things we do at Nash Housing is that we know how much the people can afford when they come to us, and we try to create a structure that they can work to meet, as Kelly was saying, we are already turning the apple or the cart around. No, we're not turning it, actually we're saying that. We are already turning the, thing, the, 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 the equation on the other side because when someone comes into natural housing, wants a house, I can only get $85,000 in mortgage. We still give ourselves and we task ourselves with the opportunity of trying to produce a solution of some form for that, for that person. As the government, whether that person goes into rental rent to own or get a outstanding loan structure. We task and challenge ourselves every day with the mortgage things that we see to produce houses in that market. So we know flipping the script. We challenging you, we provide with the mortgage certificates and you go design. You, you see what you come up with in terms of resilience. Hi, good morning. I'm um, Robin Rajak with the IDB. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting us to be to listen into this conversation. Um, I just wanted to go back to a point that Kelly made, uh, which I think draws our attention to who is the agent of low income or affordable or social housing that we're targeting. I think at different points in the conversation, we were talking about different agents. So Kelly referred to individual, um, not owners, individuals who are little by little acquiring building materials and creating a solution. We just heard about small contractors. We have larger contractors here. We have public sector uh, developers also in the NHC and uh, the Housing Policy Unit and others. So I think we have to just be careful to differentiate at each point when we're thinking about the incentives and the framework to produce the outcome. The outcome is the same we want all the time. We want a home that is affordable to a particular class of people or different groups of people. And we want that home to be resilient to particular threats hedging our bets to the degree of how much we, 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 to what standard we build. But the process or the incentives that will produce that, that standardized outcome is are different for the different agents. And so we just need to differentiate in public policy, how are we going to incentivize the person who is building for themselves differently from the person who is hiring a contractor, differently from the, the private sector who is producing for a market that includes people of low and middle income and different from the state actors. So that's one point. And then the last point I just wanted to make was, in this conversation, whether, maybe this is not the forum for it, but where do we bridge the gap to the locational choices? Because it seems to me that there's an opportunity to, to go beyond, you, re, you refer to providing shelter, but that same shelter is also a place, a functional environment, right? It's a place where people access amenities or where they access an opportunity to earn an income. So to what extent is being more strategic about the location in which we advocate and promote more development and more housing development a factor in this whole equation? Particularly as we look at resilience and resilience being in part the product of what you infrastructure you have around you. Uh, so in some, particularly in urban areas, you have sunk costs in infrastructure that's there you have a lot of derelict buildings, you have a lot of underutilized buildings, but you have the surrounding infrastructure. So the question would be, can we be, uh, is there an active discussion about being more strategic about locations to capitalize on that infrastructure? And in that way, perhaps also reduce the cost of the new infrastructure that has to be built and the, perhaps the cost of land because you can get a, a more compact form of development that is still uh, creating an environment that is habitable and, and enjoyable. Um. 
to the, to the last graph I made quickly, there are a number of streams that government's pursuing in terms of this housing solution rollout. There are a couple of streams that we're looking at, some urban rege regeneration, urban rejuvenation, where we're looking at existing sites to put in new housing. So that takes, take, takes care of some of the infrastructure costs. That is part of the discussion we're having. Um, this one kind of frames itself that we're looking at in, in terms of new building, almost new build. The streamline of that is that with the subdivisions that we do and the layouts that we do, we should encompass the issues of infrastructure, flood, reserve, flood, flood controls and things like that. Again, the houses will be modified to be site specific. So there, 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 are, there are some streams that are going on together, but today we're just dealing with the basic design of the, the in situ situation of the house. Um, so that, has a, that is ongoing. That is always ongoing at NSC for example, new site, the water engineer, what it looks. The other point, that's why we, with the different stakeholders, that's why we thought initially to put it into the bands, to have that kind of discussion. We can have a further discussion with the ministry part the PSS, so how we will finish, how we roll that out. But the idea was that you are dealing with different groups who do different things. Now, long term, I suspect, if a person is doing individual bill on a plot of land, that hopefully their contractor or their person who's working with them would be au fait enough and be trained enough to recognize what Emil was speaking about, what colleague Emil was speaking about, the, of building the resilience on, because there are people who do it on their own, but that they have the knowledge of how to produce the resilient package, or they can come to us and even take our design and follow it in a package and follow it and produce a resilient house. With us, and in, at the macro level, we are producing and fine-graining the resilience immediately. So our end product will be fully resilient. So that's the kind of way we probably were looking at it. So that's why we try to produce the different bands, because there are people who will go to a draftsman. There are people who, who would have more means and will engage my friend, Ms. Vicky Telford, and Granville to do their work for them. There are people with those means, again, in different, in different bands. But the idea is, across the socioeconomic band, there is a base level of resilience. And that because you are, I don't want to use the word poor, or you're less off, that you still can produce a resilient home. I grew up in a child house that went through Hurricane Allen and all the little skirmishes in Barbados that did not rot. It had a gable roof and a shed roof. It did flood when they had the five or seven inches of rain at the shed roof back because we had the bottom of the hill. But we weren't washed away. We, we weren't. Think. So there are some architectural stylings in Barbados that we know that work. Why did it disappear? Is it a training concept? Is it a training level you need to bring back? My colleagues from QSN tell me that the cable roof is too expensive to do. Challenge the designers and the QSs and the architects and the draftsmen come back with something that tell us how it could work. You don't necessarily have to go to a 45, but again, that's what the discussion is, how to improve the resilience. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Paul Best. I'm a built environment researcher Ex analyst for the Americas and Continental Europe. It was based in Luxembourg, where I analyze just about every type of built environment, te emerging built environment technology uh, in affordable housing. I'm also ex UK government administrator for three level one boroughs, central London, Oxford, where I work for departments such as engineering services, uh, Camden corporate property, parks and open spaces, CSDP, uh, administering loans for property improvements for critically sick and disabled people, which is actually a very important factor of when you're developing housing for afford affordable housing because you have to think of the whole life cycle um, when people become ill. Everyone's going to age, and the government of the United Kingdom usually expend a lot of um, loans, zero interest loans, to improve the lot of people being able to live in those houses for the rest of their lives rather than put them into geriatric hospitals because it's cheaper if you can help them stay in their homes. Um, with regards to the technology and the RFP proposal, I'm concerned about cognitive bias. Cognitive bias, I've seen, and I did my dissertation in this area in 2008, is doing the same thing. It's when policymakers do the same thing, because this is the, way, the same way, because they've always done it. And the problem here is I believe you're limiting emerging technologies. There are actually technologies out there developed in Australia, Saudi Arabia is actually, they've invested in Qatar in, this, in the Australian technology, which has then been bought by Caterpillar, which can build, I'm talking about technologies that can build homes 
in three days, three people building in Terra Home in three to five days. I'm talking about modular technologies which can, three men can put a, use a single aluminum precast mold and build a home in three to five days. Uh, approximately seven years ago, I developed a research entity called iMod Structures. I, well, I actually, if you go to the domain, I had to sell it because an investment banker, a, a larger company in California, made me an offer. But I sold that. But I still have the entity, which became very popular in Asia. And what it was was modular designs for affordable housing. And fearing that, one, a profit would be recognized in his homeland, and two, arbitrage and cognitive bias. I didn't see Barbados as a place to launch that solution immediately. I believe that Africa and Asia would have been a better place to promote it. And it did prove that Asia, it was more taken up in that segment. And without even visiting, approximately 560 built environment professionals really took to that, to the, that emerging technology. And I will be prepared to offer it, I believe, 900 square feet, the, as the Prime Minister suggested, 400 and 600. That, that whole idea is totally off the books. As you see what's happened in Silver Hills and Mendo Social House, what you call social housing. But I believe the, the, the agreement, at least in the School of Architecture and Construction, where I graduated in 2008, was that the correct terminology is affordable housing. That does encompass what you say is social housing, but also as someone that the government sponsored to study public sector economics, the terminology, we don't want to stigmatize homes. You just use the term affordable. And however you make it affordable, for whatever different segments, you do that. Regarding the cognitive bias in solutions, which I believe the approach has to be broad. It has to encompass engineers. I'm not an engineer, I'm a built environment economist. I specialize in public sector economics. I'm an ex-public sector administrator. I'm a specialist in construction or real estate economics. But I have a company with a design that's been endorsed by engineers and architects worldwide. So when my company submitted, do I have to, I guess I have to pay an architect to submit it to you, but I will. But I'm talking about the affordable housing basically. You can get homes between 20,000 Barbados, that's 10,000 US, that's 900 to 1,200 square foot homes, built in three to seven days between 20, 1,000 Barbados, 10,000 US to 40,000 US. Those solutions are currently available. The problem is with artificial intelligence, as we've, we've, we're hearing, not just in housing, but in other industries, for the small tradesmen, they're gonna to have to be adaptive because now you have the solution, but now you've opened Pandora's box because where's the jobs? Because now it's all of a sudden, and, and then the, the private, the arbitrage, the private funders, the people who wanna make a profit, the builders, where the, where's the money? You're talking about building homes for people at a price which leaves very little profit. But I say don't be, don't be afraid because efficiency in one area will balance out into other areas of the economy. I'm quite happy to see 300 homes built within the, within the next decade. But I actually have publicly gone on the radio and said the solution for Barbados being that 30 to 60% of, of the world live in urban areas, urban areas and most people are demanding urban environments that the solution for Barbados will be to carve areas, so some of the urban areas, Spikestown, Bridgetown, Oystins, and we need to form an urban regeneration authority. I have a green light zone where people can get the government, just like Dubai, as done in Qatar and the Middle East, the government will get the plan permission and the most efficient, if you research it, Structural solution to build will be a seven story. The reason seven is because above that you get fire risk rate issues. You get issues with escaping the building in an inefficient time. But up to seven stories you can actually crawl out the building, jump out, break a leg, run down the stairs. But up, that's why the entire of London has a seven story covenant. And that was done over a hundred years ago. If you walk through London, all the buildings are no taller than seven stories except a few but you can get down seven stories in time before most people before the building burns. And the whole of Bridgetown, with an urban regeneration authority, the government does the outline plan to mission and let it go. Seven years of incentives, and you can, in a, build, a, a developing economy like Barbados, about 20% of our economy, I believe it's even more because of tourism and, the, and 350 hotels, more than 20% of our economy is the built environment. 
in a developed economy, that's 9 to 12. What that means is that there's opportunity, but there's also a risk. It means that many jobs are tied up in a built environment. It means that if you have arbitrage, if you have red tape in a built environment, you're going to make life difficult and you're going to squeeze the jobs of many people. So it has to be managed very, very carefully. But if you do it right, you can, there can be economic stimulation through urban regeneration. And um, I welcome this, but there, there's going to need to be a lot more public consultations, open consult, whatever committee is formed, there's going to need to be open consultations that, um, I don't work for government now, but persons that may have experience, this gentleman is a Barbadian, he's a Dr. Uh, Walton, that person's like Dr. Walton, can freely come and say, listen, this is our experience. We offer this to you for free. I, I'm here to, I will tend to the, the iMod, the design, probably give it to Barbados for free. And there are many people who have this experience and we don't want to exclude it. So there's going to be more, usually consultations, you have a series of consultations. And, uh, and I look forward to seeing more of the openness, more of the consultations, and I look forward to being a part as best as I can of the solutions. But I will say, in the cognitive bias, we have to be open to be aware that we are all cognitive bias. We all bias, and we want we have to fight it because we don't want to eliminate the most efficient best practice solution. Thank you. Mark. Yeah, I think that wraps up the session. Apart from closing out on con how we continue from here, the Prime Minister has said that she'd like to see us come together and out of ourselves come up with a select committee. Now, you know, you can volunteer, but we, 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 want the, the, we want the architects, the engineers, we want small contractors, um, people from the housing planning unit, um, Fallon, Abdul, uh, Dr. Walton, you know, you can volunteer to be on this committee. We still have to, we haven't really had the discussion that we really wanted, which is to people to say, well, these three designs for low income and these three designs for low middle. So we still need to get that bit of it done, and that is the job. So, you know, you can volunteer yourself to sit on this committee. We are going to make our conference room at the Ministry of Transport available for us to come and sit and finalize what is required of us to be done here. So, anyone who is so inclined of their own selves to offer themselves as a volunteer, yes, please. Nicole. Anyone else? Barbados Architecture of Ink. Come, come, come. <laughs> we also like to have the small contractors on board with us as well. Very important. So we just take names. Colleagues, um, I'd like you to assist, <clears throat> assist Mark as we try to put this, commu this committee together. We have to work in very, very close collaboration with the, with the Ministry of Housing and um, Mr. Lord, especially at the point in, with the RFP, because if I, if I caught accurately what the Prime Minister was saying is that we should have this committee together to discuss the RFP before we actually we actually put it out. Is that the thinking of, of the room? Okay. What was the thinking, Charles? First, to the RFP go ahead, but the committee meets and develops the criteria for which the RFP, uh, the goals, the, the persons from the uh, selection criteria. Can we repeat that again? That the... <clears throat> RFP go ahead, the committee meet to determine the criteria to assess the RFPs. The next question is, uh, if you are on the committee, does that preclude, preclude you from being on, from submitting the RFP, if you are on the committee?
it don't, it, that sounds like a bit of a conflict of interest, doesn't it? Yeah. But I mean, it's all one Barbados. We all want Barbados. Um, yeah. Please remember, just a minute, Raymond. Please remember before you speak to give the names because we are still in the process of, um, of recording. Yeah, Raymond. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. What we're going to do is take the suggestions back and we're going to reframe the RFP, probably send it back through the, the ministries for comment, um, then publish it. We're going to take a lot of things you said on board. I don't think you should worry if you end up being on the committee guiding that you're going to, because what will suddenly happen, we won't let you judge in your own cause. You know, you, we won't let you, because framing it and saying how it would be judged is different from judging it, because we just put together different teams to look at. Then we've done it before. So don't worry, but the more people who want to submit proposals, that's great, because it's a, it's a, the RFP is a really call for ideas and strategies. Um, don't get caught up too much with the, with the price and the structures. We're going to do some amendments that make it easier for people to read. But apart from that, you would recognize that we are doing affordable slash, so I don't know, the terms change from year to year. Um, Housing and it order is to get to resilient resilient structures. That's a key thing. Russell, Russell, just a minute, so that we are so that we are clear. We wouldn't have persons who are going to be submitting on the committee. That's what we were thinking of. Broadly, BAA, BIPE, BAPE, Town Planning Society, so that we will have representation from those from those agencies to remove any to remove any, um, any possibility of, of conflict and also before eliminating, eliminating, um, eliminating persons. So if someone is coming on as an individual who knows that he or she will be making a submission, but then it is advised that that person should not be on the, um, should not be on the, should not be on the committee. No. Um, what, what I was just saying is that in terms of, of the committee and so forth, it, it could be a little ticklish too because there's, there's, there's the evaluation part and then there's the setting of criteria. I believe that maybe we could, we could look at it, but it has to be discussed because there, to be honest with you, you, you can't ask architects and engineers and erudites to submit something and then not be involved also in the criteria that be used to evaluate those submissions because they will be the best persons to sit and discuss that so i think in terms of the committee we may have to look at a, a two-tiered aspect in terms of evaluation separately to setting the actual criteria for evaluation because the criteria for evaluation should really involve as you said those bodies but obviously if you are representing the BAP or the BIA you could very well be a person who would want to submit um, you know a submission to the RFP so I don't know if we could look at it two-tiered in terms of the selection criteria but then an evaluating committee separately that, that in that in that way but it is is yeah because, I mean, procurement guidelines will indicate that that is possible. You can have somebody for setting the criteria, but then the evaluation committee is, is somebody separate. Yeah? But the guidelines are clear, so the evaluators are quite objective when they are looking at the criteria that was submitted. And it, and it shouldn't be overly technical. So I think that's where we, we need to split it. Um, thanks. That point is that point is very well taken. I see a lot of the heads in the room nodding, so we need to put that we need to put that committee in place so that we can start moving the process forward. And um, Mr. Lord, I think as you know, you don't have you don't have much time, so therefore we need to put this um, committee together quickly. And Mr. Maynard is not here, but. Um, I, we, Mark Durant has said you can utilize the space at the Ministry of Transport Works and Maintenance. I don't want to be previous, but I'm assuming that we can also have similar access to the Ministry of Housing because we are working in this together and we want to get the, to the um, finish line 
but having the best possible, best possible product. So therefore, we definitely need, um, we, 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 we definitely need to have some representation from the small contractors. We want to have representation from, um, well, Mr. Pandor has already, has already um, volunteered. We have BA, PE, BA, BIA. Andy, can I volunteer the Town Planning Society? To sit on the committee? Not you, this, the broader society. I mean, just for general, just for general guidance, if necessary. Okay. But we need to we need to move forward so we can get this committee together to have to so we can get this process up and up and running. I'm sure Mr. Lord is going to do the necessary tweaking to the to the um, to the to the RFP. Mr. Phillips put out the challenge to you. He said, "Give give us a course." Give us the criteria, and we will design. We will design to suit. You don't have to give them a square foot, a square foot, a square footage cost. So let's let's get rolling so we can um, we can we can move we can move forward. So do we have our? I have our BAP. It's okay, Mr. Brown. BIA. It's okay, Vicky. Um, who is representing the QSs? Tony? Okay. Um, Andy has already spoken. Obviously, Mr. Lord, Mr. Pandor, Housing Planning Unit, this is really their call. Um, small contractor representative. Gentleman has spoken earlier from Spring Homes. And also... Um, Prime Minister had made reference to a proposal that Inatech has submitted with respect to, to roofs, so also Inatech. So she says seven, but I have, actually have ten. The committee is much bigger than originally, um, originally intended. Yeah, Charles. You're talking about the we mentioned groups who may consider stakeholders and a group of persons here who represent and consider the innovators. I think you need to, to include them. Who want to include what I've been saying for the last ten minutes, volunteers. No, no, no. So right, so okay. Just do me the favor. Those persons who are interested. Um, Nicole was going around with a piece of paper. Put your name on that piece of paper, and that will save us. That will save us a lot of um, a lot of backward and forward. And then we know exactly who we have. We need your name, email address, and also your telephone, and also a telephone um, telephone contact. And in that way, we will then be able to determine exactly how we are going to proceed.
ladies and gentlemen, sorry for the, sorry for the break. Um, it is now 12.35, and we are five minutes beyond the 12.30 time that we had scheduled. I want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your very busy schedule to attend this national consultation. We know that we did not give you a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of notice, but we are very impressed with the turnout, equally as impressed with the contributions, and we thank you very much. What we will do, we will put this committee together and continue working at great pace so that we can move forward and the Ministry of Housing, Lands and Rural Development will have that RFP out so that we can move forward and have the necessary design and design competitions. We will, we will take everything that has been said into consideration and I hope that those persons who are interested in sitting on the committee will put their names on the committee, put their names on the paper and please do not leave immediately after we close. Let's just have a short huddle so we can determine the way forward. So I thank you very much. I wish you, uh, I wish you a, a good day for the remainder of the day and safe travels on your way from our consultation. Thank you.